Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the final session of the 2020 Virtual International Head and Neck Cancer Conference. This year it's hosted by Ian Nixon, consultant head and neck and thyroid surgeon NHS Lothian. Welcome to session four, which is going to be on living with and beyond head and neck cancer. Does this mirror make me look fat? Hooray! <laughs> Coming up in this session, we'll be hearing from Emma Hallam, supporting patients to live with and beyond the late effects of cancer treatment. Ben Sheard, head and neck cancer survivor. Keep moving, keep smiling, keep going. Alex King, psychological care for cancer treatment and recovery at the point they need it. Phil Johnson, laryngectomy survivor, life begins on the table. At the end of each session, there'll be a question and answer section. Questions and comments too are on Twitter at hashtag, and these are all capitals, HNCCONF2020. And do follow us on Twitter too. So that's what's coming up. Now don't forget to download your copy of the Delegate ebook. First, we have Emma, who's going to provide a unique insight into supporting patients with the late effects of treatment for head and neck cancer. Emma Hallam is a Macmillan consultant radiographer at the Nottingham Radiotherapy Centre. In 2013, she dedicated her role to support head and neck cancer patients throughout their treatment pathway. Hello, my name is Emma Hallam and I'm one of the consultant radiographers at the Nottingham Radiotherapy Centre and I'm here today to talk to you about supporting patients to live with and beyond the late effects of treatment and in particular that's radiotherapy and chemotherapy. So we know that living a life with a history of cancer is unique for every person but there's a common thread and that is that life is different afterwards. For many we'll go on and have a, um, a healthy happy life with no problems whatsoever but for others, life will be different. The effects of radiotherapy treatment in particular can last a lifetime and can often have a devastating consequence on a patient's quality of life. Patients are often living with such consequences which are often ignored or not recognised by other health professionals. And evidence suggests that patients with um, late effects from cancer treatment can have a reduced quality of life if these complex needs are not addressed. So in 2013, Macmillan did um, um, a questionnaire of 2 million people that were living with the consequences from their cancer treatment. And 40% said they were unaware of any long-term side effects. Now, I know when I sit in clinic with patients that, that we are much better these days at telling patients about the late effects of treatment they may experience. But even at that point, I know that patients really just want to know, can they have any treatment and is there anything we can do to try and cure this cancer? The survey showed that 78% were suffering with physical health problems that were related to their treatments and that 40% were living with emotional problems and hadn't sought any help. And 71% of those um, patients who'd finished treatment 10 years ago or more had experienced a physical health problem in the last 12 months that was directly related to their treatment. And this was a real pinnacle really for us wanting to set up our late effects service in Nottingham to try and help these patients who were living many, many years past their treatment. Just a few other facts there, and that's that 63,000 were living with lymphedema problems, 350,000 were living with chronic fatigue, and 240,000 were living with mental health problems that they didn't have pre-diagnosis. So we know that one in four cancer survivors will have one or more treatment related consequences and the problem is that patients who have what we call multimodality treatment, so those who may have surgery and radiotherapy or chemotherapy and radiotherapy together, are actually at a much higher risk of developing these late effects. As we know we're curing so many more patients, um, we know that by 2030 there's going to be over a million people living with these side effects from their treatment. 
The issue we have is that these effects are not just physical, they're often emotional as well. And also this then feeds into the practicalities of that, can a patient get back to work? Are they able to earn financially? And the spiritual impact that it also has. So patients will often say to me, you know, life is really different and it really gets you thinking about all these patients that have got unmet needs and we're curing these patients, but we're curing them and but at what cost? So the Penn study in 2012 um, did a data of 4,000 cancer survivors and of the head and neck patients that were that was interviewed, 83% had got swallowing and speaking problems, 88% were living with a dry mouth, 33 had thyroid issues and 53 had cognitive like memory problems. And what was quite interesting from this study was that <clears throat> they showed that there was a very clear lack of communication between the patients and the oncologists which can have a real major impact on a patient's long-term health and well-being. What we know about late effects is, for head and neck in particular, is that some are just bothersome, bothersome and can have a negative impact on the patient's life. So therefore, maybe it could be that they've got a dry mouth and it's not really um, impacting what they're doing, but it's bothering them. They're waking up at night with it. It's disturbing their sleep. But for some patients... These effects will also affect the normal functioning. So it means that they, you know, they can't swallow certain foods because their mouth is just too dry. Or in fact, that, in fact that their swallow function is not working as well as it was. So they have to really adapt what, they, what they're eating. But for some patients, it can be life-threatening. Um, certainly for those patients who may be at risk of aspiration. So that's the patients who, um, if, they, if they try to swallow something, then potentially it could go down the wrong, wrong hole, sit on their lungs and cause um, pneumonia, which can be really fatal for a patient. So who am I? Well, I'm an information support radiographer um, for head and neck cancer patients, and I've been doing this since 2013. And my job here was to support patients and their family throughout radiotherapy and chemotherapy, um, helping them to manage their treatment regimes, managing their side effects, and really helping to support them with any psychological um, and support issues that they might have. In 2013, I also helped to set up um, and develop the Nottingham Late Effects Service, which is a, a service funded by Macmillan. Um, and over the past few years, I really started to recognise the increasing needs of the head and neck patient cancer group um, in this late effects arena. We're seeing more and more patients coming to us with these unmet needs. Um, and in 2019, last year, I was really fortunate to become a consultant radiographer in late effects, again with Macmillan funding. So the Nottingham Late Effects Service then. Well, we're a bespoke service um, for any tumour sites. That's for any patient who's had chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Um, who's still struggling with um, some problems, um, we can offer advice and support to help patients manage um, and manage these problems. Um, our aim is to provide highly specialised care for cancer patients throughout Nottinghamshire for patients who've been cured but are six months out of treatment. Um, and like I said, we really do try and help patients to, to, to get back on track, really, try and see how we can improve their quality of life and see is there anything we can do about these late effects that they're experiencing. Then in um, last year, um, we, um, like I say, we, um, I got some extra funding to be able to um, work specifically with the head and neck cancer patient group and to be part of this head and neck cancer support and therapy team that I set up. We know that this patient group represents the highest number of patients with significant unmet needs that we were seeing in the late effects service uh, and are a real priority group of patients for the East Midlands Cancer Alliance. So just some data then from the actual um, late effects service. Um, so since 2014, we've seen 275 patients um, for head and neck late effects. And the longest out of treatment was 43 years. On average, patients tend to be referred to our late effects service between three to four years. So three months, nine months to be exact. And patients will always say to me, why wasn't I referred earlier? You know, why would I been telling people at follow-up? the surgeons and the oncologists, why have I not been being referred to your service? So just to um, step aside away from the service a bit now, just to talk a bit about what, what late effects, what, what's it described in the booklets that we might give to patients as health professionals? And these tend to just list dry mouth and changes in saliva, taste changes, risk of tooth decay and bone damage to the jaw, changes in eating and drinking and difficulty swallowing, Changes in hearing, pain and stiffness in the head, neck and shoulders and the jaw, 
and also changes to how you look. But we actually know that this is very different in practice. And this slide here just shows you, um, this was some um, data and comments collected from a, a patient support group in America um, a few years ago now. And they asked patients um, to list everything that they were experiencing that w was related to the chemotherapy and radiotherapy that they'd previously had. And as a group, they could list 62 different um, effects that could be contributed to their treatment that they had. And the patients at the point were saying, you know, that all of these things are just not being picked up by clinicians. So what do we see in our service then? Well, these are the um, the main main um, side effects or consequences of treatment that people report when they come to see us in the late effects service. And this goes without saying dry mouth is one of the big ones, but difficulty in swallowing is the weight loss. The tooth decay, so patients will often come in with um, black teeth or crumbling teeth. Osteoradionecrosis is quite a painful condition where we've damaged the blood supply to the jaw um, and can often result in needing an operation um, and, quite, and some quite um, intensive pain management. Stiffness in the jaw, neck and shoulder area. Hearing loss, tinnitus and uh, balance issues. We see a lot of patients with lymphedema and this swelling around the neck uh, and the face. Fatigue is always a, a really big one. I'd say every patient that comes to see us will always highlight fatigue as, as, as a need. And we're talking chronic fatigue for a lot of patients uh, where this just is not relieved by rest. Peripheral neuropathy often caused by the radiotherapy but also by the chemotherapy that we give patients as well. So this is tingling of the hands and feet, patients not being able to dress themselves properly or not being able to judge where they're putting their feet when they're trying to walk. Pain is a, is a big one that we see. And we've also seen patients with carotid artery pain tenses. That's where the furring of the carotid, carotid arteries have happened, happening, putting patients at risk of stroke and also thyroid issues. And that's just the physical issues. We then tend to go on to see patients, or, or, or hand in hand for many, I have to say, who've got body image concerns. I see, I've seen a number of patients who've had what we term survivor's guilt. These are patients who, who feel that they should feel like they're lucky to be alive when actually... They really would rather um, not be feeling as they are now. And they feel guilty for expressing to some of the clinicians that this is how they feel and how they've been left. Um, I've also had one patient who said, I, it would have been easier if I um, had died because my life insurance would have paid out the mortgage on the house. And because I can't work anymore, I feel like a real burden to my family. So it can be really difficult. Adjustment difficulties, patients trying to having to adjust to this new way of living. Um, often with nobody helping them to do so. And we also see a lot of patients who um, relationships break down after the treatment. Um, this can be um, sometimes because the fact that they're you know, no longer able to communicate the way they were, they're not able to sit and eat at a dining room table anymore because they're on 40 sip um, supplement drinks. Um, so they've lost all that social aspect. But some patients are never able to kiss their partners again um, or to want to be intimate with them. Um, and these have real impacts for patients and their lives. So it got me thinking as we were seeing patients over the past few years in the late effects service, what could I do? What could I really do to try and help these patients? I was so fed up of us being a reactive service that I wanted to say them I wanted to find out was there something that I could do or that we could do as a team to really try and support these patients better in the after treatment, but also can we try and reduce the risk of these um, site late effects happening? So what I wanted to focus on was the early identification of me. So how can we pick up sooner that patients are struggling rather than waiting for them to be referred in? And also, can we do some rehabilitation? Is there something that we can do to try and prevent the late effects getting to the degree that they're getting to when patients get referred to us? So about three years ago now, um, I set up a post-treatment um, combined clinic. So this is a clinic where all patients are seen two weeks after treatment finishes um, by myself, the speech and language team and the dietitians. And this is a real opportunity for us to be able to try and really pick up on what the patient's needs are at that point. Often it's a time when patients feel quite lost after treatment. Um, they're so used to seeing somebody every day when they're having the treatment saying, hello, how are you? And then suddenly, you know, we wave goodbye to them. Um, so it's a real opportunity for us to see how they are. But I've started to realise that this would be a real focal point for me to start addressing the, the issue around late effects. Um, and trying to just see, well, if this is how your acute effects with the effects you're dealing with now, how are you going to be in a few months? 
So taking on from this and with the funding that I got from Macmillan to extend my post, um, we now, I now review all patients at four months, excuse me, four months post treatment. And this really provides an opportunity for me to really sit down with the patients at this point, somebody that they know through they've seen throughout the treatment, um, but somebody who really understands radiotherapy um, and might be able to give some um, insight really as to how things might progress from now. So these appointments are often an hour or so long um, and we offer a real holistic view of the patient. So I'm really looking at the patients as a whole, you know, what things are really bothering them at that time point. We also developed um, a PROM, so this is a, a, a questionnaire, it stands for Patient Reported Outcome Measure. What this does is actually gives the patient the opportunity to answer a questionnaire to say how they're really feeling. Um, and this questionnaire covers everything that the patient might potentially experience as a late effect from treatment. But what's great about it is it doesn't just cover the physical aspects, but it also covers the psychological and the psychosocial aspects um, that somebody may experience from having a cancer diagnosis and um, um, subsequent treatment. Um, so all patients now will fill a, um, a, a one of these questionnaires in. Um, soon they will be digital, they're not at the moment. Uh, any day now we'll be going live with those. Um, and then what I'd like to do is also do this on a yearly basis with patients, really trying to see, um, keep an eye on these patients in the long term really, again really trying to highlight and pick up if anybody's starting to get any late effects. So just an example of this, this might be patients who start to suddenly get some discomfort in their neck or the neck just feels a little bit stiff. Well, I want to intervene at that point rather than wait until two, three years down the line when we've got something called radiation fibrosis that's set in and the patient can't, can no longer move their neck anymore. Um, the great thing about the, um, about this, about my, the four month review clinic and subsequent annual clinics is that I can get the specialties in the room at the same time if needs be, because these things will be highlighted by the specialist questionnaire that patients have filled in. So if they need a speech and language therapist or the dietitians in particular, we can make sure that we're all around the table um, at the same time, really helping to, to help the patient. The other thing that I have the um, privilege of is, is of having direct referrals to many specialist services that I've worked with in, within the late effects um, arena. Um, so we can do these direct referrals, again, saving waiting time for the patients. I've done a lot of work over the past few years um, in, within the late effects service um, with lymphedema and lymphedema management. And the lymphedema team at Nottingham have just been excellent in supporting our patients. Um, and we've really started to realise that early identification um, and management of lymphedema, uh, lymphedema sorry, by using a specialist home exercise and management plan, which we've um, developed um, along line, alongside with the speech and language team and the physiotherapy teams, could really be useful for these patients. <clears throat> and so now all patients are asked to participate in this home exercise programme because the idea is, is that hopefully going forward we're going to see less late effects by, pa by patients having participated in this exercise programme. So I just want to talk a little bit about the impact of lymphedema in head and neck cancer because it really is um, an area that is often um, not recognised by many health professionals and is so important. So I thought I'd just talk about the impact of that on a patient's quality of life. So we know we've got the physical um, aspects of this. So this is um, where lymphedema can affect difficulty in breathing, um, can produce swallow problems, so patients can't manage to get their nutrition on board, so that can lead to weight loss and malnutrition. Infections, so if the skin becomes infected, if they've got lymphedema, this can be really quite problematic and quite a serious condition. Trismus, where the lymphedema, so the swelling starts to affect how wide the patient can open their mouth. And this whole just reduced movement in the whole head, head, neck and shoulder area. But it's also the social aspect, as, as like I did too earlier. We know that the relationship changes often happen um, when patients start to experience these um, these um, consequences. Um, I've got one patient who just doesn't want to go out of the house because she feels her lymphedema is so bad now. You know, somebody else would say, well, that's absolutely fine, put a scarf around your neck, but she's so conscious of it, she doesn't actually want to return to work. Uh, COVID's been great for her, she's been working from home, but she says she's absolutely dreading the day that she's made to go back into the office. We know it affects patients wanting to go out and eat in social areas. Um, they don't want to eat anymore in restaurants because they're worried that people are going to look at them if they start to choke because of their lymphedema and the restriction it can put on their swallowing apparatus. 
and also just not being able to partake in physical activities because we know that lymphedema can also affect your hearing. And this leads on to like, you know, these impaired communication that patients can get. So the inability to wear their glasses because their eyes are so swollen, so they can't read or they can't see what they're doing. And they can't hear, like I've said, and again, their speech function will often be affected. And the emotional side of it that comes with all of that, like I've already addressed this body image and this survivor's guilt and these real psychological issues that some of these patients can experience. So we know that 75 to 90 percent of patients will suffer from internal or external lymphedema or indeed both. An identification of this swelling at around three months or more post treatment in head and neck cancer could be really beneficial, beneficial excuse me, for these patients. Early edema often presents as a heaviness and tightness, but can be very, very subtle. So this is why it can often be missed. And we know that for earlier stages of lymphedema um, can be reversible. Um, but if left untreated, this can lead to fibrotic tissue um, and can lead to resistance for more intense therapies. This is why it's so important for me to get in at this four month um, po time point post treatment to get patients onto this exercise plan, identify if they've got some lymphedema and then we put a special collar in for the patients to use and the outcomes have been really quite um, significant. Um, we know that early treatment and educating patients about lymphedema could really prevent this late stage lymphedema when it becomes really problematic and can reduce the associated burdens and really improve quality of life. So this is out one of my patients who um, kindly agreed for me to use the photographs in this presentation today. He didn't want his eyes covering up because um, he's just really pleased with the outcome from his um, management of his lymphedema. So. He came to me in July last year. He was actually probably one of the first patients I reviewed, reviewed sorry, in the four-month post-treatment um, clinic appointment. Um, his main problems at that point was dry mouth, but he was back at work. But he was really a bit bothered about this turkey neck as he called it. I've got this bit of a turkey neck, Emma, Emma, underneath. Um, you know, it's not really bothering me. It's not really doing anything, but it's just a little bit of a nuisance. And every time I look in the mirror, it's a constant reminder of the cancer that I've had and the treatment that I've been through. So... He set off using the home exercise management plan with the um, Hereford collar, which we got for him. And three months later, he came back, had photographs taken again. And you can see here the, the, the difference um, in, the, in, in the patient um, in his neck. And he's, re he's really pleased with his outcome. So he, will, he is continuing to follow the um, home exercise management program. He doesn't always use his collar anymore. He doesn't always need to. But if he feels that the swelling starts to build up again, he has the collar in. So these are just some results then from the patients that um, I've seen since I started this four month clinic um, um, just over a year ago now. So 81 patients have been reviewed since August 2019 and 53 of these patients actually filled in the, the paper format of this questionnaire. The questionnaire itself identified 35 patients that had got needs that they didn't feel were being addressed. And the clinic itself um, identified 63 additional needs. For patients, for 63 patients, sorry. So overall, 83% of patients at four months of treatment had what they felt were significant unmet needs. Now, what I do need to address here is that this doesn't mean that these needs have been ignored. It just means that maybe necessarily the patient didn't feel that they were being addressed. Um, although actually some, some hadn't been picked up. Certainly the lymphedema hadn't been picked up in any of the clinic documentation. So 94% of patients gave 10 out of 10 for the service and the information that they received and 88% said they found the clinic really, really useful. So this um, pie chart just shows um, the needs that were being dealt with during the clinic by myself in particular. Um, so this just shows basically what I was dealing with in-house. So everybody had fatigue, so um, we didn't put that on the, um, on the pie chart. But as you can see there, lymphedema was one of the key things that I've been picking up at this point. Um, other things involved pain, um, psychological issues, um, trismus, so the, you know, the reduced mouth opening, peripheral neuropathy was often not identified, and chemo brains. So this is where patients are losing their memory a bit, this cognitive functioning after treatment. And then these are the referrals that I needed to do to onward services. Now, obviously, here it, I have um, um, separated out the speech and language therapist, but again, they were then the patient word, the issues were then dealt with in the clinic. Um, but you can see that we did have to refer a, a few patients back to the surgeons. Um, and that was because I'd actually picked up some, um, a couple of patients who'd got recurrence. 
Um, but you can see we managed to do these direct referrals and pick up and meet these patients' needs. So this um, slide just shows some of the patient feedback. And I just think it's really powerful when we get statements like, um, she looks at me as a whole and not just a cancer. Uh, one patient said to me, oh, thank you, you made me feel normal. You made me feel that what I'm experiencing is normal and your questionnaire is obviously looking out for what I'm what I'm feeling. So that was really good um, good to, to receive. Um, so what about the future then? Well, I've split this into two. So certainly for the lymphedema side of it, because this is something that um, we're going to continue working on um, with the lymphedema team in Nottingham. Um, what I will just say is the lymphedema team in Nottingham are not based on our site of our hospital. So it's about an extra half an hour journey for patients to actually see the lymphedema team. Um, so it really does reduce patients by me doing the management, reduce the, the patients having to make an extra journey, an extra clinic visit. And because they're getting so many of the other needs met at the same time, this is why it's been really effective. So what we want to do though with the lymphedema team is um, set up a specific MDT, so a multidisciplinary team meeting where we can really meet to discuss any tricky lymphedema patients, so patients who've got this problematic lymphedema, but so that I can give input into the other late effects that the patients might be experiencing as well. We also want to roll this initiative of work out to other hospitals in the East Midlands um, and to also look at other models for other um, tumour sites. Um, and we'd also like to really work with health professionals to really try and educate them to improve their identification um, of head and neck lymphedema because we're recognising how important this is. And then for the late effects service, um, I'm um, developing a specialist interest group with another colleague of mine, Lisa Durant, who um, is a lead consultant radiographer down, um, down south. And we're working with the Society of Radiographers um, to really set up this specialist interest group because there's so many radiotherapy departments that really want to help patients uh, manage their late effects. And what we want to do is really ensure that everybody has got access to somebody who has experience with late effects and that can at least advise, at least if they haven't got a late effects service. But on the back of this, we want to set up a national multidisciplinary team meeting. Macmillan tried this a few years ago and it didn't really work, but we're hoping that because it'll be based around radiotherapy centres and having a key person in every centre to bring patients to the MDT, um, then there will be, this will be a much better way of um, providing this service. I also want to work a bit more in partnership with key people within our own um, head and neck MDT to really try and break down traditional barriers, to try and make services much more proactive. I want to stop patients being referred three or four years down the line um, or patients being referred to me when, when they don't know what else to do. I often get emails saying, Emma, I don't know what else to do with this patient. Just refer them to us in the first place because we really, really are a service that can help. And what I'd ultimately want to do is to make sure that everybody who's had cancer will have their vital needs met by having rapid access to highly specialised late effects services and that such needs will also be monitored on an annual basis to ensure that the complex physical and psychological needs are addressed. So I just need to um, acknowledge some people um, because I know I've very much talk, probably talked about myself and what I do for the service, but I am part of a huge team. Um, firstly, Liz Stones, who's my colleague in Late Effects Service and the whole of the Nottingham Late Effects Service. Um, the Nottingham Speech and Language Team and Dietetics Team, who I'm so lucky to do great collaborative working with. Um, the Nottingham and Derby Lymphedema Team, who have provided me with all my training and my lymphedema management skills. Um, in particular, Karen Dring, Anna Rich and Sarah Dodd. Um, to Nancy Jamieson from Guys and St Thomas Lymphedema Service who developed the exercise programme and that we've adapted and also to Macmillan Cancer Support because if it wasn't for Macmillan we wouldn't have fund, had the funding to set up the late effects service um, and also for my extension of my role to be able to really focus on helping head and neck cancer patients. So thank you for your time today. My contact details are on the slide there. I'm more than happy to speak to any patient or any other health professional about late effects. Um, so yeah, please get in touch if needs be. Thank you for your time. My wife said, if I buy one more guitar, she's going to leave me. God, I'm going to miss her.
Well, actually, probably not. Hurrah! My name is Lisa and I'm a registered dietitian at a university cancer center in Colorado. I've been working with head and neck cancer patients for close to a decade. And I believe that the registered dietitian and patient collaboration is crucial during treatment. The dietitian can help educate and advocate for the patient so that they make it through treatment um, and optimize their nutrition throughout the entirety of treatment as well as post-treatment. Um, the registered dietitian can provide tips and tricks, especially regarding nutrition, but also other uh, medications and therapies to lessen symptoms related to treatment. Good luck with the conference. I hope you enjoy the two days. Sorry we won't have our display stand, but please go to allrelief.co.uk for information, leaflets and any samples you need. Hiya to everybody there at the Swallows Conference from me, Emma at Bio Extra. We hope you have a fantastic couple of days there. We've attended in the past, unfortunately it's all virtual this year. We've thoroughly enjoyed it and we hope you take a lot from the next two days. My message to you from Bio Extra, keep lubricated and keep well. Take care. Bye bye for now. Hi, I'm Linda Tomarelli. I'm a speech and language therapist and I work for SpeakNeek. We create personalised synthetic voices for use on communication aids. My role is to support people to go through the voice banking process and to work with healthcare professionals to enable them to help their patients use our voice banking technology. I use my background as a speech and language therapist to help repair voices where the patient may have slowness or slurring and to design voices for people who have no natural speech. This means our personalised voices are accessible to everyone. Speak Unique create personalised synthetic voices for use in communication aids. This allows people to communicate in a voice that is identifiably their own through text-to-speech technology. I'm Ewan McDonald. I'm from Edinburgh. I'm Ewan McDonald. I'm from Edinburgh. It's so hard to lose speech, so anything that reduces that sense of gloss helps. In these modern times, medical technology has come a jolly long way. Here you are, sir. Enjoy your leeches. Today's leaders in technology really know their onions with the wonders of modern science. Robotic surgery knows no bounds. I say, you young scallywags, stop playing with the equipment. Indeed, it can breathe new life into patients. Now look at that marvellous healthy glow. Isn't the NHS wonderful? Where would we be without it? Where would we be without it? Where would we be without it? would we be without it? Yes, of course, the NHS really is wonderful. And today more than ever, it's embracing modern technology for the benefit of all our lives. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the field of robotic technology. Cancer patients across the world are living proof that investment in state-of-the-art robotic surgery is working. Science is working and we must continue translating science into better cancer patient care. Hi, it's Mike Heffernan from Dr. Hef's Remarkable Mints here. Uh, I hope you're enjoying another conference, albeit in a virtual world. Uh, I also thought it would be a good idea just to let you know that we're now working closely with Swallows Charity and you can buy uh, Dr. Hef's Remarkable Mints in our new packaging uh, from our website and you'll get a 5% discount if you enter in the discount code SWALLOWS2020. And the benefit is that Swallows also get a 5% uh, revenue uh, into the charity to continue doing all the great work that they do uh, for both carers and patients alike. I uh, wish you all the very best for the rest of 2020. Bye for now.
Hello, my name is Sam and I work for Flen House. Flamagel RT is for the management and prevention of radiotherapy induced skin reactions. It does this by creating the optimum healing conditions to accelerate cell renewal. It provides a protective barrier against external contaminations and provides a cooling effect that reduces pain on the patient's skin. In clinical studies, 7% of patients experience moist decamation when using Flamagel RT compared to 35% of patients using Dexpanthenol. This is why we're pleased to say that 94% of patients said that Flamagel RT met or exceeded their expectation. Mouth Cancer Action Month takes place every November. We work closely with the Oral Health Foundation and all head and neck cancer charities to promote the event when dental practices across the country try to raise awareness of all head and neck cancers. To find out more or to join our annual 10K Awareness Walk, please visit our website www.mouthcancerfoundation.org. Welcome to your New Look Conference, coming to you from the edge of space. Next we have Ben, who's a head and neck cancer survivor, who's going to talk about the importance of physical rehabilitation after treatment for cancer. Ben Sheard was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer in September 2017. After seeing the doctor for a persistent sore throat and cough, Ben was originally only given a 50% chance of survival. Welcome to the Head and Neck Cancer Conference. Laughter is the best medicine. Keep moving, keep smiling, keep going. My name is Ben Sheard and thank you very much for coming along to listen to me this afternoon. You can see from my qualifications at the bottom of the screen that I am qualified at least, if nothing else. Um, maybe not quite as relevant as some of my esteemed colleagues that I have the pleasure of sharing the stage with this afternoon, but qualified nonetheless. I think the first thing we need to do is say a huge thank you to Merck, MSD, Bristol Myers Squibb, without whom none of this would be possible today. So guys, thank you very much indeed and well done. But I think also we need to say a huge well done to Chris and Sharon. They have managed to pull this off despite a huge pandemic. So keep moving, keep smiling, keep going, or as my grandmother said, keep on keeping on. What I want to do today is help you understand your why. I want you to question, what is your why? What is it that puts that fire in your belly? What is it that makes you want to carry on? I want you to know your why. You can change your why at any time. It is your why. It's not anybody else's, it's your why. And as we go through today, you will start to understand a little bit of my why and a little bit of my journey. And I'm hoping that that is going to inspire you to find your why. So what qualifies me to talk about this? I am a cancer survivor. I had stage 4 cancer of the tonsil, the tongue, the roof of mouth, the throat, the lymph nodes. Wasn't in a great place really. So if we look, going back to July 2017, uh, I was quite happily living my life, enjoying things as we all do, and I developed just a little bit of a cough that I went to the doctor about. The doctor gave me some tablets and said, take these, come back in a week's time, which I did. Uh, they then said, okay, it's not gone. Need to test you for glandular fever. They tested me for glandular fever and it wasn't glandular fever. So I phoned up and said, okay, it's not glandular fever. What is it? And thankfully the lead GP within the practice, uh, I live in a small village, very understanding guy. He called me in we talked through things and he said, look, I'm going to refer you to ENT because you've got the, th the cough, you have a lump on your neck, let's just get this looked at. We know it's not glandular fever, we know you've taken the antibiotics, let's just see what goes on. 
So they sent me to ENT, which eventually the appointment came through, uh, who asked me to go and have a scan. I had to chase the scan up. You understand that hospital administration can be challenging. Eventually, um, I get through to ENT and they say, yes, we need to remove your tonsil. And so the kind of the journey begins. But you will notice there is no cancer diagnosis in here. The reason there is no cancer diagnosis is the way I found out that I had cancer. I had just had a general anaesthetic in the morning. I went home in the afternoon and I slept for a day and a half. And I'm going through my discharge notes with my wife. And we look. And that's when we discover I've got cancer. So we go back and we have the session with Macmillan that you then have and the various discussions and that's when I'm given the really great news, 50% chance of surviving the next five years, but at least they gave me an extra 10% for being positive. When you're given that kind of news, you look in strange places for help and advice and you get support in strange places. Now here you'll see my dog actually trying Reiki. This was two days after I'd been told I got cancer. I woke up to find her climbing into bed with me and trying Reiki. We went through the peg fitting, the MRI scans, the mask fitting, the session with oncology, and eventually treatment begins. Now I call out peg fitting for a particular reason. This is a peg, feeding tube, how I receive my nutrition, as many of us receive the nutrition during treatment because we can't swallow. I went into hospital, um, A&E, during treatment, with a really bad headache. It turns out it was actually radiation burns to the base of the skull, top of the uh, neck, that had damaged a lot of the tissue there. Um, but during the time that I was actually trying to understand what was happening, I met this particular doctor and part of this discussion was trying to convince her that I wasn't on morphine for recreational purposes. And also, when she eventually said that she wanted to examine me, I took my top off and I'm stood there in front of her, pretty much as you see me in the picture, and her words to me were, what's that? It didn't help build my faith with the hospital team that I was dealing with at the time. Anyway, so treatment continues, chemo radiotherapy, the radiotherapy, the dietitian with radiotherapy, radiotherapy on its own, the blood tests and radiotherapy. It's a challenging time. It's difficult and towards the end I was tired, I was sick, I was sore, I was depressed, I was feeling very sorry for myself. Uh, I actually suffered with radiation burns on the outside and inside of my neck, both of which became infected. Um, and that was quite an experience. When I was going through radiotherapy, there were two thoughts going through my mind. The first was, I actually lost my mum to head and neck cancer. And was it my time? I was 19 when she died. My son was 19 when I was going through treatment. I just kept thinking, is it my turn? But the other thought I would have, I'm glad it's me. I've got this. I'm going to get through this. And I kept on. Then by Christmas, um, I was actually eating. For those of you that have been through head and neck cancer treatment, you understand this is a huge step. I still struggled going up and down stairs. I was still tired. But Christmas Day, I'd had two mouthfuls of food. I was winning. By February, I went back to work, I'm an information security consultant, 
and so I was working. I also decided to start at the local gym. I wanted to get back into shape. I wanted to be able to walk up and down stairs comfortably. I wanted to start living life. In the May, I went to Africa with a group of friends. We got on a yacht and then off we sailed because we were celebrating me being alive, still being here. During that year, I had my hip replaced, and like all normal people, uh, when you're convalescing from having a hip replacement, I drove around Silverstone, starting my friend's Bentley. I went sailing with a friend. I went off on my motorbike camping. I kept smiling, kept going on. I also kept going to the gym. I got stronger, I got fitter. These pictures were taken a year apart. The one on the left was just before treatment started at Macmillan Coffee Morning. The one on the right, almost a year to the day later, you can see the difference. It was about the January then of 2019, my local gym asked me, would I like to become a trainer? They approached me, they said my story was quite inspirational and my positivity they hoped would inspire other people to go on their own journey and progress. So I went to gym school and I became qualified as a gym instructor. I worked as a gym instructor for a while, I was doing cyber security. But one thing I do have is a very low boredom threshold. So I was looking for my next thing to do. I decided to step into the ring. I've never boxed before in my life and this was for ultra white collar boxing as a charity boxing event for my first ever boxing fight. I was fighting fit, I was ready. My fight was booked March 28th. I was there, I was ready to step into the ring, but then the world got locked down, we're put onto quarantine, the pandemic struck. I'm now stuck at home, but keep smiling, Keep going on. I did what everyone else does. I baked, I baked bread, I made fudge. I went round the streets dressed as Batman. But what I also did, uh, I actually towards, still got bored. I learned, I went back to school. I started learning to box and I became a boxing for fitness instructor. Here you can see me actually training with my wife. These were up my submission videos to the Ricky Hatton School of Boxing. Uh, because if I'm going to do something, I like to achieve with the best. So as time went on through lockdown, I became a, a network security engineer at uh, Fortinet Devices. I qualified as an advanced boxing for fitness instructor. But lockdown was still happening. I'm still bored. I found a way to go back to gym school and I studied, I learnt, I learnt my skill. As we came out of lockdown, I, I was fortunate enough to actually visit these guys in person and as lockdown lifted, I became qualified. I'm a level three personal training instructor, I'm a nutrition advisor, I'm a kettlebell instructor, a boxing for fitness instructor, a circuit session instructor and this is all since lockdown. But, keep moving, keep smiling, keep going. My low boredom threshold gets the better of me. And so next year, I've still got my boxing match planned. I also have a car rally booked. We, a colleague, a good friend of mine and I, we're going around Europe in a car that can cost no more than 200 pounds. So I think that's gonna be quite an interesting journey. And that brings us to where we are today. You've had an insight into what my why is. What's your why? What keeps you going? What drives you? Find your why. Just one last thing I want to say before we go. Uh, as you're watching this, I would like everyone to please lift your foot. Just one foot, just lift it in the air. Give it a bit of a wiggle. Put it back on the ground for me. 
lift that other foot up, give it a bit of a wiggle. As you put that down, Chris, we have just had the first Swallows virtual training session. Guys, thank you very much indeed for your time. Take care, find your why. Hi, it's Guy from CC Med. Just want to wish everyone at Swallows all the best of luck at their virtual head and neck cancer conference. Such a shame we can't be there this year, but let's hope to get some get together next year. We at CC Med obviously look after the ASLI Royal Farm Dry Mouth range. If you'd like to learn more about that, then please visit us on our website. In the meantime, best of luck. Sure, it's going to be a great couple of days. Really looking forward to it. My name is Amber Thomas. I'm a registered dietitian and a board certified specialist in oncology nutrition. Before I started my own private practice, I worked in a cancer center for over 10 years and we primarily helped individuals through head and neck treatment. And I feel very strongly that working with a dietitian is very important for your success going through such a difficult treatment. The dietitian should be able to help you find foods that you can tolerate, foods that you can eat, which may include things you're not used to or changing uh, the texture or modifying the food in some way because of the side effects that you'll experience. Your dietitian should know the side effects for your particular treatment and be able to provide you guidance even ahead of time before those side effects actually happen so you're prepared and you're ready to stay nourished and stay strong. So working with a dietitian is absolutely so important to help you heal both during the process of treatment and after. Hello everyone, my name is Lewis from Flint Health. Many of us are suffering from skin reactions that often gives us no choice but to give up on the activities that we enjoy the most. We at Flen Health want to provide innovation that allows everybody to enjoy the life that they love. This year we are proud to be supporting this year's Swallows event and honoured to be involved with such an inspiring charity that work extremely hard to help patients and carers. At this year's event we'll be hosting an educational breakout session which gives you the opportunity to learn more about radiotherapy by one of the country's most respected radiographers. Also a fantastic opportunity to discover a solution for your skin that at present may be very sore, itchy and red following on from radiotherapy treatment. It is extremely important that this year we bring clinicians, patients and supporting companies together as one to be supported and to support others. Hi, this is Joanna Knight from Capitex Healthcare. Uh, we're very proud to sponsor the virtual Head and Neck Conference 2020. Thank you. Ho ho, hee hee, ha ha. Rutherford Cancer Centres. We're here, right where you need us. Hello, my name's Daniel Hughes. I'm from Aspire Pharma and we really hope you're enjoying your conference today. We're here to talk to you today about oral mucositis and dry mouth, specifically alprolite mucosamine. You can find out more information about mucosamine by visiting our virtual stand. We'd love to virtually see you and we hope you have a lovely virtual conference. Hello, my name is Abby Miller. I'm a speech and language therapist working at Chesterfield Royal Hospital in North Derbyshire. I recently won a fellowship from the National Institute of Health Research 
to help me learn how to carry out research in the health setting. And I'm studying a master's at the University of Nottingham. I would like to use these skills in order to benefit patients with head and neck cancer. We know that people with head and neck cancer return to work less often than people with other cancer types. I really want to understand what it's like to return to work following head and neck cancer, what was tricky or what helped you. So I'm keen to speak to anyone who has gone back to work to understand your experiences and I would do this by a one-off interview either on the telephone or virtually at a time to suit you. If you'd like to find out more information or take part in this study, that would be fantastic. You're very welcome to contact me on my email address. I also have a Twitter account um, where I recently wrote an article explaining what's happening in the research internationally around head and neck cancer and return to work. So please do contact me or of course you can leave your email address and contact details with Chris and he'll pass them on to me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Philip Lewis. I'm the president of the Mouth Cancer Foundation, the national charity which supports everyone affected by the disease. We work to improve awareness and provide education, both for the public and healthcare professionals. Early detection is the key. That's why we've developed our self-examination protocol. To find out more about us or to join our annual 10K awareness walk, please visit our website, www.mouthcancerfoundation.org. Hooray! Dry mouth affects one in four adults within the UK and can have a significant impact on your overall health. That's why we created Auraleaf, a complete oral care range for dry and sensitive mouths. The enzyme system found in all Auraleaf products helps supplement natural saliva to help keep your mouth healthy and comfortable. Designed with dry mouth sufferers in mind, our products are free from alcohol or foaming agents that can irritate a sensitive mouth. Headquartered in Luton, Bedfordshire, our small and super friendly team works to help raise the awareness of dry mouth with healthcare providers and patients alike. You can visit our website, drop us an email, or give us a call from Monday to Friday, 9am to 5.30pm. We are ready to answer your questions about our range and process your orders. We love hearing from you. Oraleave, making dry mouths happy again. Hi, I'm Dr Elaine Emerson and I'm a research leader at the Centre for Regenerative Medicine, a research centre at the University of Edinburgh. Join me for a special behind the scenes virtual tour of our laboratories and to find out more about our research to develop new treatments for head and neck cancer patients recovering from radiotherapy. Uh, when Chris was diagnosed, he just switched off straight away. He didn't take anything on board, he didn't listen to anything. He just went into his own little zone. He, um, he decided he couldn't peg feed himself. He was just far too lazy to be bothered to do it. He just couldn't be asked, basically. Um, he thought it would be so much better for me to feed him. Um, coming from a day's work, in my black work suit, have to feed him and then decides he's going to cough and this mixture flies all over me and he sits there laughing like right, you know clever sod that he is when poor me is dripping in all this food I've got to clean it up it's still on the ceiling because he can't be asked to clean it off or even decorate um, he went into his own little what I call cancer bubble where it was all about him he didn't care about me or the family. He just sat there like a right miserable little twat. Um, you know, to be honest, that's my nickname for him now, miserable twat. He's not got any better. You know, he puts a big smile on for everybody else, but he don't give a shit about the rest of us. <laughs> I went to a really tough medical school. We had to find our own cadavers and bring them in. 
Next, we have Alex, a consultant psychologist from London, and is going to talk about the role of psychology in recovery from head and neck cancer. Alex King leads the specialist psycho-oncology team at Imperial College Healthcare NHS and is actively engaged in the development of psychologically minded cancer pathways and programs. Hello everybody, I'm Alex King, consultant clinical psychologist. I specialise in cancer care and work at Imperial College Healthcare. Um, that's an acute uh, Centre for Cancer Treatment in London and it's a major cancer centre uh, treating uh, thousands of uh, people um, in a year and my team are cancer specialty psychology uh, we're dedicated to cancer care uh, and uh, work amongst the various um, specialties including with uh, head and neck cancers um, so uh, we are tremendously, tremendously kind of excited about the sort of work that uh, Chris and Swallows are doing. Uh, we will do kind of anything to sort of support and develop that work uh, because it sort of covers an area of psychological need that specialist services like us kind of can't possibly reach um, and, and speak to kind of needs in a different way. Um, so what you're doing now is tremendous and really, really helpful. I know I hear it from people. Um, but I wanted to uh, spend about 20 odd minutes uh, today and uh, you know, please bear with me with a, with a kind of a homemade recording um, uh, the, to sort of talk, uh, talk with you uh, about the psychological aspects of cancer treatment and recovery, particularly how to find uh, psychological care and what happens then and what to expect uh, because I think sometimes it, it's not entirely clear although it's an obvious issue uh, how cancer experience or head and neck whether it's surgery chemotherapy radiotherapy in the context of, of your cancer care your thoughts and feelings and how you react and feel psychologically will be very affected um, what psychological care is necessary for that isn't entirely obvious. Uh, it is not immediate in the same way that, you know, you kind of will need an oncologist for chemotherapy. Um, it's more complicated than that, not surprisingly, because, you know, the rest of the stuff is, is kind of quite straightforward medicine. The psychological part is the interesting bit. So... Um, if we kind of start by looking at this sort of um, little roadmap, the first thing I want to do is... Uh, what, talk about when, when to seek professional help, what are the indications, when does normal distress that's kind of going to be part of the experience of cancer become a problem. Then we're going to talk about where, where to find cancer psychological care within the NHS and that's the UK's National Health Service, which is public, publicly available sort of health care, free at the point of access. Um, and maybe to bring you up to speed with kind of how does it all work and what happens if it doesn't. And then finally, if indeed that is the right thing, uh, what might happen in a specialist cancer psychologist session? Um, how do psychologists like me talk to their patients uh, and what about? Um, and an early hint here, it does not involve telling anybody about your mother. Um, so, first off, when do we suggest that people seek help? Now, uh, we, of course, expect people to be distressed. It's very unlikely that anybody will experience um, can diagnosis of cancer, treatment, the recovery, particularly in the context of head and neck cancer, uh, which can be uh, complicated, extended, potentially disfiguring, disabling in so many ways. Um, it might be a bit easier and smoother for some people. There's a whole range of experiences. So there's no definitive um, uh, kind of, uh, it's not like an operation where you kind of know, you know, A, it's going to lead to B. But we know that most people will experience a degree of distress and some for some people it will become a problem. So 
We'll start by talking about what is normal distress and when are the signs and symptoms that it's actually tipped into becoming a problem. How do we see it from the inside and how might we notice it from the outside? Um, we're going to talk through a couple of tools for self-evaluation, so I'm hoping you can take that away. And, you know, maybe if you're thinking about how am I doing, you know, you might sort of fill those in and see which kind of, um, uh, which side you're on. Um, and maybe sort of talk to talk a bit about the barriers that might stop people presenting for care. So to start off with, um, what we're talking about kind of normal distress you know, sometimes we, we think quite sort of simplistically uh, about distress, yeah? We think that we're in this kind of stable state, normal life, and then comes this stressor, cancer diagnosis, we're then obviously in this stress state. Um, and then if the whole thing kind of blows over and goes away, you finish treatment, um, you're okay, you're back in that same stable state, and you've recovered, and life goes back to normal. Now, anybody who's been through it knows that's not the case. But nevertheless, we kind of tend to think like that um, and don't have another model or idea to kind of map on what happens uh, psychologically uh, through cancer treatments. Either, you know, I go back to what I was, um, but that doesn't work. But that leaves us with no other model. So here is something I was going to propose. Um, uh, so, kind of having a, a look at this uh, slide five here. Um, look at the uh, this little slide. And you can see it's actually a kind of a process. It's not linear. It's not kind of A leads to B. It's a process that we all develop uh, mental models about how the world is and how we are and how our lives are uh, through a complexity of experiences in our background. Um, it includes, you know, early experiences, later experiences, health experiences. Um, and the reason is that as human beings, we kind of use, we learn from the world to develop a sort of understanding of how it might work. So we might kind of, uh, arrange our behavior going forward. So off we go and we find some new experience in the world and either we are able to kind of make sense of it in technical terms, assimilate it into our existing model and if so, we probably kind of go, yeah, okay, I expected that, yeah? So I've had that written into my kind of plans or my ideas about myself, yeah? Um, or we find something we are not able to assimilate, something that didn't really um, exist or make sense or kind of you know, hadn't been embedded in those ideas. And often the diagnosis of cancer, and even more so, the kind of complexity of recovery from that, uh, what it actually means to have had it and be recovering from it is something you cannot possibly have as a mental model unless you've been through it before, somebody really close to you have been with it before, and even then you've seen it in somebody else, you haven't got your own. So it's very, very unlikely that people will come into this with a mental model of what it means uh, and what it does and what to expect. And this is not purely about the illness, this is very much about the self, relationships, the sense of future, hope, uh, so understandably, when that kind of expectation that we had before, naively, you know, they'll be okay, uh, is shattered, uh, of course that will be distressing. And at the same time, we'll be learning. We'll be getting new information that will be adapting our mental models of the world. And as long as the balance of kind of how distressing it is to how much support we have, and I, solidarity is also crucial, is... It's the sense of kind of safety and solidarity, the sense of kind of having people you can trust and will be with you to see you through. To the degree that you have enough of that, and for some people more and some people less, um, you're able to manage that distress and learn and adapt your kind of mental models and kind of come through this, you know, every bit of the experience and kind of go, ah, that's what it was like. So now I've learned and I, you know, it's probably not something I want to adapt to, uh, but I recognize I have to adapt to. And now this is my new normal. This is how my body functions. This is how my world functions. And then, of course, this goes around quite quickly because, you know, the first few days of treatment are different to the last few days of treatment. And then the first few days of recovery are very different to, you know, a few months later in recovery or a couple of years. So this isn't a case of a one cycle thing. You're going to be learning and you're going to be distressed 
um, when things kind of don't don't follow some expected hopeful plan, yeah. And even if they do meet your kind of best expectations and best hopes, there's still a challenge to what it was before. So there's constant distress and learning. It's not a one-off. And I hope you can kind of see that that allows us a bit more flexibility to understand what normal distress is, which is basically a challenge to what we thought ourselves and our lives were going to look like. Now, often when you know the, the degree of that distress is very significant, and we're looking at slide six here, we often try to describe it by using um, labels such as anxiety, depression, or traumatic, or uh, somebody's got, say, OCD, they might say he's a bit OCD about things, or, you know, even worse, somebody might say, you know, well, they're suicidal. Um, and one of the things to take away, I, I hope, from this presentation is if you look at the kind of understanding of distress and that it's kind of part of the process, what we don't want is to kind of rush to apply labels to these, because these are appropriate labels when there is a a mental illness, as in a really, really um, kind of a specific set of thoughts and feelings and symptoms in the body that are really, really kind of outside the range of normal. Yeah? So normal includes a lot of distress. So we should not reach for labels to uh, describe something that is actually quite part of the normal process. So Anxiety descriptively, worry, fear, yeah, depression in terms of sadness or loss or a sense of uncertainty or lack of confidence. But to, to rush to get the label down doesn't necessarily help us. The labels are very important and very helpful when we need to identify and treat things, but we should not rush to them. So that's the first thing not to do. Um, I'd rather people... Um, really look and describe, uh, you know, their experiences. And, you know, they can describe their experiences in terms of behavior, what is visible from the outside. So irritability, uh, whether the person is withdrawn or avoidant, really sort of like, no, I can't, I won't, not for practical reasons, but for a fundamental kind of, I can't, I just don't want to. Um, particularly kind of feeling and behaving kind of quite withdrawn and early in the mornings. That's a particular sort of clinical sign there um, that, you know, they're having panic reactions out of nowhere or that sleep is very disturbed beyond what would be uh, happening uh, because of whatever procedure, symptoms, pain is happening. Um, and, of course, on the inside of the thoughts and feelings. A person might be harboring these without them, those being obvious on the outside, but excessive sense of guilt, persistent and excessive, you can see up there, um, being marked, that sort of mark, um, uh, identifying that, you know, it's not a passing thought of, a, of, you know, I wish I could have done better, but it's a really excessive guilt, like, I'm, you know, I'm the person who's really deserves this happening to. That's the level of, of kind of distorted thinking that we would identify as problematic. Hopelessness, not just a sort of momentary or realistic appraisal of difficulty, but a deep sense of this isn't going to work out. You know, flatness, no affect, no, no feeling, not even, you know, enjoying something, a lack of sort of sensation almost. Uh, kind of nightmares alongside with bad dreams that are persistent, tension, agitation. Um, and not just the odd thought, but actually the person actually sort of tuning into thinking about, actually, life's not worth living, so I'm actually going to plan something to end my life. And that's where it tips over from distress. So here are some of the signs and symptoms on the outside and inside that tip over from normal distress, um, the distress that is part of the experience, to kind of the bit where it's actually we're tipping over into something that's actually stuck. Uh, that in, the, in everything that's happening, it's affecting the person's kind of mental state in such a way that they're getting stuck. And this is what those components would be like. Um, now, here's a very simple way, looking at um, slide um, uh, eight here. It's a very simple way of kind of taking stock. Yeah, 
Um, so this is a range of emotion thermometers. An overall distress is the first one, the orange one, the green one's an anxiety, blue is depression, red is anger, and the gray one is for need for help. So the question is here, if zero is not at all, and 10 is the most intense that you can have, uh, what's been your experience in the past week in terms of this? And distress means overall global sense of how you're feeling, anxiety specific to that, tension, stress, agitation, depression is more the low, the helpless, hopeless, sad, anger is that kind of uh, explosive or irritable or agitated in a in a kind of perky way feeling um, a need for help is again an opportunity to say whether you feel these are really kind of not right yeah they're not part of what you would expect uh, in yourself and you need some help with them so filling those in um, should give you an indication of where you are. And usually, uh, you know, it depends on for different sort of populations and sort of time points, the sort of cutoff points. And, and don't take them too seriously. It's not like, um, you know, you're eight, uh, you're eight and you haven't got diabetes and you're 8.5 and you have got diabetes. But um, we usually consider the point of five and above as a point for this needs clinical attention, yeah? needs investigation, needs further assessment. Now over to the next scale in slide nine, uh, and that's the PHQ scale. It's very, very common um, scale used to identify uh, people sort of struggling with their mood. So over the last two weeks, it asks you to list the degree of difficulty, if any, you've had with interest or pleasure, feeling depressed, your sleep, tiredness, appetite, you can see that, you know, for instance, with people who really are in the thick of it, let's say with their, say, radiotherapy and, you know, poor appetite or overeating, you know, they might be tempted to rate that as a sort of a, fun, a you know, the physical problem to rate it at that. But it really means um, it really is addressing the sort of uh, sort of depressive level of uh, symptoms. So you might have some overlap there with your physical condition or treatment. Um, and that's understandable. You can see this, the cutoffs there. Uh, that you know anything over ten, mild depression is usually not a kind of category that prompts, uh, that requires clinical attention. I think the word depression again there is used, kind of potentially. You know, so it's a low level of symptoms. Yeah, but when we get to the moderate level of symptoms, anything ten and above kind of requires um, clinical um, attention. And the GAD then is the next slide on sort of uh, page uh, on slide 10, and it said, does the same with symptoms of stress and anxiety. So the PHQ and the GAD scale, the emotion thermometers, hopefully will help you identify. Now, of course, even if you do identify some difficulties, there are lots of barriers that you know people tell us might stop them from seeking help. And first of all, the physical stuff, the treatments, their energy levels, too many appointments, too many people to deal with. I've got enough on my plate. Regardless of how I'm feeling, I can't deal with that right now. Sometimes people kind of don't reach out for help or don't ask for help because of the problem itself. So if the problem, for instance, is anxiety, generally people will, will sort of want to avoid that and might even want to avoid even talking about it in case somebody actually brings up something quite dreadful. So uh, very often people are sort of dreading, let's say, fear of a recurrence uh, in a way that's way in excess of their actual sort of risk. It's a real psychological uh, difficulty. Um, on top of the reality of recurrence, yeah? Um, so it sort of dominates their minds, but they're so scared of this that they daren't even mention it because they also have to think about it. And they also imagine that they might actually have to think about or do something about it in a way that makes them even more distressed. So sometimes the problem itself is the barrier or hopelessness in the case of depression. Um, and... Uh, people might have ideas about how their cancer doctors might interpret that. So if you say to your cancer doctors, whether it's a surgeon or unconscious, I'm kind of having trouble coping, people might worry that that might mean they're not offered an next treatment or uh, people kind of uh, take some of their other symptoms as psychological. Now, that's not a small barrier. 
That's a considerable barrier. Need, people need to trust that their doctors take those um, concerns uh, just as importantly and uh, you know, without actually that unduly affecting their health care. They might be so severe, one's mental state, that there might be treatments that are actually a really bad idea that might cause more harm than good, but that is you know, rarely, rarely a consideration. Um, and often it's about attending to both sides equally and in parallel and appropriately, as opposed to uh, stopping the medical stuff happening. Like, and I'm kind of hoping that, you know, in our sort of talk today, we can kind of dispel some of that. And, uh, you know, if people identify that they need help, that, it, you know, some of these barriers that you hopefully might take from this presentation, that these are undue barriers. So having... Um, you know, perhaps people identified that they're struggling um, beyond what would be kind of a normal, you know, what, what they would expect. Uh, you know, what would they do next? And I'll talk, I'll be talking here really about the kind of sort of, sort of system or pathway, as they call it, of, you know, the, the fancy kind of healthcare term is the pathway for dealing with sort of cancer psychological care. Um, in London, in our part of the woods, and, you know, in, in more general terms across the UK. Um, so in the UK, we've got uh, kind of, uh, we've got a, a cancer clinical nurse specialist uh, that every patient should have access to. It's kind of one of the sort of standards of care. Now it's not always staffed or available, but in principle, there's a team of cancer clinical nurse specialists, sometimes called Macmillan nurse specialists, because Macmillan is an organisation that has put a lot of uh, kind of money into trust to provide these roles, but they do not employ those posts directly. These are healthcare cancer nurses uh, that at some point were sponsored to start in that role by Macmillan, uh, but are now kind of uh, part of the, you know, part of the healthcare team. Um, so while people are in treatment or early recovery, they will have access to cancer clinical nurse specialists who will do what we call a holistic needs assessment, so kind of a, a review that might include those th emotion thermometers, where basically it's flipping over the idea of as a professional, I need to assess certain things to flipping it over to, as a patient, what are your needs and priorities? So the cancer nurse specialist will do a holistic needs assessment and a care plan. Ideally, they may not do it explicitly, as in now, dear patient, we will do your H&A and care plan. Um, they might actually use the information in discussion with you to synthesize that, just to cut down on the, on the bit of admin and... Um, and kind of lingo, but in, it's a good thing because it, it really is about looking at the kind of holistic needs of the person. And of course, distress means it's, you know, it could mean lots of things, right? It could mean social things, usually finances, job, role, family. It can mean practical information needs. Uh, what happens next? What do I do? So distress, although it's a psychological experience, might actually be best addressed through other much more practical and functional means. And that's what the holistic needs assessment is for, the care plan is for. Now, if people are late in recovery, maybe you're going to the hospital only you know, once a year for a checkup, you know, really the point of call is going to be their GP. And their GPs at some point would have done what we call a cancer care review or are meant to have done a cancer care review. You can ask your GP about that. Um, and if we are in... A kind of context where cancer experience, your head and neck cancer experience is in the background. It may have left some consequences. If they're not that complicated, uh, probably you're under the you know, annual review or six monthly review in the hospital, but not much else. Uh, and it's about low medical complexity and later in recovery, so two, three, four years out, uh, the community psychological therapies teams probably have enough of a role there to help people. And of course, all through the process, whether you're in treatment or recovery, third sector organizations like the Swallows are going to be crucial uh, to supporting people's uh, psychological uh, well-being. So those are the places where I would encourage people to sort of ask for help. And of course, you know, uh, if you look at sort of slide 13, that is exactly what happens. Then we have well-furnished rooms, of course. Uh, you know, you can see I'm working on the receding hairline and the, and, and the beard. Uh, you know, the furnishings are just going to take a bit longer. 
Uh, but you know, sometimes we 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 have a, a kind of a, a bit of a naive idea that we're still in the 1900s, and um, you know, we're going to sit people on a couch. But what's really going to happen is that, say, the nurse specialist is is going to do what we call a level two assessment. That's kind of up from just the sort of discussion with somebody uh, where you mention that you're very distressed. That's what we call a level one. The level two is the nurse specialist actually getting into it a bit more and asking you, okay, so tell me a bit more about it. What's been going on? What are the signs and symptoms? How you've been feeling? Um, tell me a bit about your background. Tell me a bit about what else is going on. And if it appears to be reasonably uh, within certain parameters, um, get it, it, there's not an awful lot of complexity. There's a sort of degree of, sort of stress or low mood that is kind of maybe quite intense, but kind of within the parameters of what they would expect, because they've seen thousands of people, right? So they use their expertise and knowledge to kind of get a sense of, right, okay, is this a sort of thing that is quite common and normal part of the process? Let's do some first-line intervention. Let's give the person some advice and guidance, some active attention here, and some support to try to see if they can kind of use some techniques or skills or ideas to kind of address their stress and difficulties, or whether this needs specialist attention uh, because of various complications and complexities. Uh, the GP equally will do something similar, might check, uh, might do a first kind of first line assessment, might do some signposting, what we might call social prescribing, or refer to community or a specialist service, or suggest some medication. These would be sort of psychoactive medications. Uh, that would be appropriate for the type and level of symptoms you are experiencing. In general, um, they're a kind of an adequately effective methods. In general, psychoactive medication is a reasonably effective kind of method. It's worth uh, worth a try, particularly if people are uh, kind of needing, um, are kind of unable or unwilling to kind of uh, consider the talking therapies. Um, for, for whatever reason, it is worth a try. Uh, but as always, the, it's in the detail. So it's a really good discussion of the general practitioner of, uh, is important. And um, if, uh, if a person kind of attends to um, community psychological therapies, what, I, what, we call, what uh, we call IAPT, Increasing Access to Psychological Therapies, it's the name of the overall initiative within the NHS. And there's a service of that in every, every borough. Uh, or every uh, council or district within the UK, there is a, there's a service there. And if you contact uh, contact them, they'll be in. They'll respond to that pretty quickly. People can self refer, or their GP can refer. Um, usually, people can self refer quite easily through a website or a phone number. Um, and they'll have a phone triage. The first thing is somebody who got to go through their needs and concerns and basic information, checks a few things out, get some background, some ideas of what's going on. It's not a, f a full, full assessment. It's basically enough to identify what direction or what choice of package. And IAP does sort of low intensity packages, which means kind of supported self-help. So uh, four to six sessions of kind of guidance and advice around specific things like, say, panic. Um, these are not cancer specific. These are not designed to uh, address cancer experience specifically. That's why we look at IAPT as a resource for maybe later recovery uh, here in the UK when the person has had, uh, you know, has recovered and, and anything they're going to be experiencing from a cancer recovery perspective is, is stable. Yeah. Um, or indeed, I have high intensity, and that's more uh, personalized uh, therapy with uh, CBT as a type of therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, counseling, or perhaps a group. Um, and usually people have options and are given options and are encouraged to choose what they feel is best, well, obviously amongst what sort of the evidence-based for um, helping that particular difficulty is. So CNS, GPs, or Community Psychological Therapies, IAPT, um, might operate a bit like that. Um, if indeed, within the acute treatment or recovery, after a CNS assessment um, and input, 
um, they consider that specialist help is required. They'll refer to counselor psychology, counseling, psychotherapy team, generally called psychology teams or something around those lines. Counselor psychological support team, they're usually embedded in the hospital, work side by side with the medical teams. Um, the, the, the MDT, the surgeon oncologist, CNS, etc. Uh, in, in the case of head and neck cancer, quite a lot of AHPs, uh, uh, such as speech and language therapists, dietitians, will also uh, potentially be referring, identifying distress and having that kind of level two discussion with a patient. And if more, if more complex care is required, um, then onwards to a specialty team. So in a cancer psychology team like mine, we'd be talking to the patient about their priorities, first of all. Uh, we'd want to put their distress in the context of their cancer. We'd want to talk through the timeline, and we'd want to be thinking about how they look ahead into the future. Uh, we'd want to be talking to them about their relationships, the support networks in the workplace, very important social context, uh, and also about their background. Any past adjustment or mental health difficulties uh, that they have noted in their lives and how those might be still active or affecting them. Uh, we'll want to know how they're experiencing their treatment, the relationship with staff, the procedures, um, and also what the person's doing in response to distress. So whether, as I said before, um, you know, they're so scared that they end up avoiding everything as much as they can, or perhaps uh, applying some self-compassion. Um, and we want to know what people are doing already and whether it's working, uh, and particularly what, what people would be really wanting to do differently. Sometimes in cancer, people haven't got a clear sense of you know, what their goal is. They'd like some problem to go away. And I think that's more in line with that discussion I had right at the beginning about that linear model. They'd like the cancer or the cancer's consequence to go away. They don't necessarily have come to the psychologist with a goal of changing how they adapt and cope. Um, so that needs to be negotiated. To what degree is the person open to kind of adapting themselves? Because in the psychological context, we, we can't change what the realities are in terms of the illness of the recovery. Um, and then, of course, we want to cover counterindications. So people who kind of drink a lot or kind of are, are actively at risk themselves or others are really not going to be um, uh, you know, engaging or kind of, uh, you know, th that's not what we're going to be doing, approaching that psychologically. Um, and we'd use this information, and if you look at sort of slide um, 16, we'd use this information to put together what we call a formulation, in a way, sort of psychological, a meaningful psychological narrative, a story about what's happening psychologically, how did it get this way, what keeps it going, what works or doesn't work, and what is the change that we could make that will make a valuable difference. So it's not about diagnosing, although we might actually need a diagnosis, uh, like say, okay, this is a depression, or this is trauma, or this is a panic disorder, or whatever. Those are not necessarily going to be as helpful as a narrative of what keeps the problem going, what needs to change psychologically in terms of what the person is doing in their mind or is doing in their day-to-day -day life. That's what we can change. So the diagnosis is really uh, just a description. It doesn't necessarily do anything by itself without a formulation. Um, so that's what we would do. And what we would hope to uh, achieve when working with a person, if you look at slide 17, is not really about their survival. Now, sometimes people think, well, if I'm psychologically kind of less stressed, then my odds of survival are better. Now, I there's some faint indications that, you know, sort of distress and survival are linked, but in no specific way. And I think uh, this, uh, if you look up the link I'm showing up there, you'll see a survey specific to head and neck cancer where there was no association really there. Uh, so, but some people hold this as an idea that, you know, less stress means kind of less health problems. And in general, how, in general terms, that is correct. But in specific terms, there is no psychological therapy um, that will improve very specifically uh, the odds of kind of cancer recurrence, yeah? Because here we're in the context of you already had cancer, yeah? Um, so we, we, nobody will, nobody should be promising the psychological therapies will deliver improvements in survival. 
However, quality of life, emotional well-being, relational well-being, and the sense of self-efficacy, sense of confidence in living one's life after cancer are just as important, right? Um, how you live is also very important, as well as whether you survive or not. I mean, arguably, only if you survive does it become an issue, but you know, it, it really is the context in which psychological therapies are quite effective in terms of emotional well-being, improving your relationships and how you interact with others, uh, and how you feel about managing your condition. There, we can make a difference. So, in summary, um, looking at slide 18, um, when do we seek professional help? Hopefully, you're uh, getting from this discussion some awareness of the signs and symptoms and the tools you can use, and you can fill those in, take them to your nurse specialist or GP. Um, you can see where you will find NHS cancer psychological care, that might be in the cancer hospital treating you, or the role, or in community care, GPs or IAPT. Um, and you might have an idea of what will be happening in a cancer psychologist session. It will start with your priorities, your hopes, your strengths, your difficulties, and will try to find a fit for you. Uh, and we'll try to kind of find the mechanism that will make a difference. So I hope that's uh, a little bit of uh, help. Uh, thank you very much for paying attention. Have fun today. I know that Chris will uh, intersperse a good degree of uh, humor uh, in the day. And uh, I wish you really, really good luck with uh, everything in your treatment and recovery. Um, and uh, that's all for me for now. Take care. A horse goes into a bar. Bartender looks at him and says, Why the long face? Hello everyone. I'm Jyoti Benjamin, a member of the Academy of Foods and Nutrition and a certified specialist in oncology, currently working at Kaiser Permanente, Bellevue, Washington State. Head and neck cancer patients undergoing treatment need a dietitian by their side on a regular basis, if not daily. The nutritional needs of head and neck cancer patients are unique and they correlate to the outcomes, short term as well as long term. There are numerous studies that support and collaborate the fact that good nutrition during cancer treatments can affect outcomes. Keeping this in mind, early nutrition intervention in head and neck cancer patients is very important. A dietitian can be a very valuable member as a part of the care team and an ally to the patient and the family. Hooray! Hooray! Have you ever wondered what happens inside a research laboratory or who the people are who are working on new treatments for head and neck cancer? Join me, Dr Elaine Emerson, and members of my research team for a special virtual tour of our laboratory. Mucosamine mouthwash and oral spray can be used together to provide a convenient and effective way to help you with the effects of cancer therapy. The mouthwash and oral spray have been proven to reduce the symptoms of dry mouth, provide rapid pain relief and help treat and relieve the symptoms of oral mucositis. Hello, uh, Mike Heffernan here from uh, Dr Heff's Remarkable Mints. Uh, you may remember uh, Toby and I from uh, the conference last year. I can't believe a year has gone by. Uh, unfortunately, because of social distancing, Toby can't be in the same room. So I, I thought I'd bring uh, an, another alternative Toby along uh, to wish everybody uh, a great year. And hopefully next year we can all get back together again. Bye for now. I was a workaholic, super energetic, fit, healthy, and a really, really happy person. Didn't think for one second that, you know, cancer would hit me. Everything changed. Every waking moment, you appreciate everything much more. The hospital stay was really, for me, mentally challenging. I just wanted to have some inspiration, and in that environment, it's incredibly hard to find. I haven't spoke to a friend who was having treatment at the Rutherford. I decided to have a look. It doesn't feel like you're coming for cancer. It feels like you're just coming to get well. 
It's a positive experience rather than I'm having chemotherapy. I'm really excited about my future. My advice for anybody starting their journey would be to surround yourself with positive people and to ask yourself what you want to do and go and do it. Hooray. Head and neck cancer is a brutal treatment. When you take the ability to communicate off somebody and to eat and drink, you stop being a human being. So what we're doing is, courtesy of one of our sponsors from America, we're actually sending patients what we call a boogie board. The boogie board is a, is a piece of equipment that the patient can write on it and then push a button and that text disappears. So we'll use this on our head and neck cancer ward for patients with communication difficulties, particularly after surgery, including laryngectomy. So the device allows you to write a message and then move on by deleting it automatically. And that's very useful for patients who can't speak, which is common after head and neck cancer surgery. Communication is very difficult after head and neck cancer surgery and it's frustrating for patients who can't communicate, but, uh, particularly if they've lost the use of their voice. So this kind of device is critical for communicating with family and caregivers and healthcare professionals during their inpatient stay. So the boogie board is a nicer way to communicate with your friends, your partner. It makes it so much easier for the patient to communicate. The Mouth Cancer Foundation and Swallows Head and Neck Cancer Charity have enjoyed a great relationship for many years. We are both passionate about supporting patients and carers every step of the way along their cancer journey. Working together makes us stronger, and when we are stronger, we can better serve everyone affected by the disease. Next, we have Phil, who's founder of the 2020 Voice Charity and is a laryngectomy survivor. He's going to talk about the day-to-day -day of living following a laryngectomy. Phil Johnson was diagnosed in 2009. Chemo and radiotherapy failed miserably, and he finally became a full larry in 2010. Good morning to you all. And welcome from 2020 Boys Cancer to the World Cancer Conference to which I've been invited by the Curtis of the Swallows organisation to speak on the subject of awareness. Long word, lot of meaning. Now as you can see, I'm a complete laryngectomy. Voice valve very failed. So I speak with electro larynx, which for some weird reason a lot of people find a bit ignominious. However, when we talk about awareness, I think back to when I was diagnosed, how did I know, etc, etc. To be perfectly honest, I knew absolutely nothing about throat cancers, head and neck cancers. Apart from you could get a tumour in the brain, which thankfully we didn't. But I started off like a lot of people. Tingly throat, cough, hoarse voice, tiredness, always falling asleep, pains in my neck. So I went to hunters and I was diagnosed with the old fatal earache. Anything to do with this, it always starts with earache. And that's because many, many, many doctors are not aware of the problems, early doors, that cause people to become laryngectomies, i.e. they get cancers worked in the throat where you can't see, or they get them deep in behind the tongue, which is difficult to see. And many doctors are very, very reluctant 
to send you off to the end either it would do me referral, which is what we absolutely need. The cost is immaterial. We're talking about life saving two weeks here. You can't put a price on that. After I heard the advice my daughter, because I was a full of, an full of antibiotics, and they painted her no worse, no less, no better, sorry. I got the same dream, and so I went to see a full daughter, a different daughter on the fourth occasion. A very young lad, fresh out of medical school, son is playing to him. Symptoms. And I said, nothing feels any different, I'm still getting the pains. And I said, just do yourself a favour. Have a look at my medical screen. You'll see I've been down here more times in the last three months than I have in the last ten years. And so I know there's something wrong. He went through his medical book. Bless him. And he said, well, there is actually a nerve run from here. No, literally here. All the way down to here. He said, I think I'm going to send you for a two week. Check up thing with the ENT. And my god, that young man saved my life. And when we got down to ENT, they got the old um, Rhino Laringus go bell. It's amazing I can say that with one of these in there. And I've got a better one for you later on. And a boat around up here down there. And the one on was, oh dear. So I basically knew then something was seriously wrong. Time to think about health. No wealth. No work. Nothing else. Health. Anyway, I was rewarded. With 10 months of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Under here. And they held up on me the bow and me that did. To be fair. It was a long old job. There were many times when I die lay on the sofa here and said to and just thought, I wish I could die. Because I don't think anybody can throw me much more of this. But we didn't, we survived and we had to tell the tale. But after 10 months, in 2010, I get feeling spongy bits. And strangely enough, they broke up. Now I've got no tumour because apparently the tumour had gone. But I had all these spongy bits. So I didn't bother with the doctors, so I took myself back to the consultant. And said, dear Mr. Consultant, would you please jet this up for me? But this just does not feel right to me. I mean, you can't be trying to eat a bit of food and feel the involvement of a brother under your chin. So he had a feel round. I saw his face in the mirror, very concerned, and then he sort of let out his big sigh and a Well, that told me everything I needed to know. This was not good. So he decided that we'd have a miniature um, investigatory, investigatory of 10 minute job, that's all it is, Phil, don't worry about it. Let me just have a look, see what's going in up here. Well, we went in this little room. And I woke up two and a quarter hours later, in recovery, with tubing sticking out of here. No voice. Feeling like absolutely dog dinner. Nurses came by and I sort of signaled and said, Can I have a cup of tea, please, or coffee? And then the full horror of the thing hit me. And not a word had come out of this. I couldn't speak. I got no voice. I got a drunky tube. Apparently, when they opened me up down here to AIDS floor, they couldn't find my um, food tube. Or the air tube. Airway, whatever you want to call it. Because they'd been both been pushed two inches into the back of my neck by this ginormous tumour. I'd actually died on the table, which is why they whipped me into the big theatre, revived me, try and sort out whatever needed sorting out. 
And they had these at the mouth all we'd lost you, Phil. He said, I really did. That was the start of a very, very long journey. Because what? when I recuperated from what, he came in my uh, private little room in the hospital. And he said to me, another two weeks, and we're going to have to pay the lot out. You know that, don't you? That's what I had gathered. So we look forward to November the 9th, 2010, where at 8 o'clock in the morning, I was merrily wheeled down through the corridors and lived some God knows what, to level two where all the theatres were. Then he said, have you got any last request? Jolly fellow. I said, yes, please, please don't kill me. I've left got a message for the wife when I wake up, and we had a laugh about it, and I was being gone. Eleven hours later, a very sad and sorry young in me woke up in recovery. And did I feel bad, oh my lord? My daughter, who loves women, she came to visit and took photos. Well, as you all might probably well know by now, there were tubes, fires, drips, drains, God knows what. Lies the Lord over me. I want to see 57 stables from here to here. Because we had the full necklace. Now, while you're in hospital, it's alright. You've got everything done for you. Every need you need, they're there. They have the equipment, they have everything to deal with everything. But when you get home, oh my lord, it's a completely different story. And again, the awareness comes in here. Now, luckily, my good lady, she was very aware of what's going on. Took notes with everything as the nurses, this and the other. And she came home much wiser girl than when she first went. We also had a Sonya machine at home, which in the early days was God sent. Now I ended up with nine, nine months of silence, no voice, no nothing. Then I had voice valve operation. Lovely, until one day, how did what? Went back, had another one. How did what? After the third attempt, my surgeon, who's a lovely fella, he said, I'm so sorry, Bill, but we can't wait to do another one. There's just too much scar tissue. It'd be impossible to make another puncture. So there was me thinking, well, that's the end of my world. No boys know me. But it was not to be because Sarah, our SLT, came round. Tried to cheer me up by telling me I could speak probably speak with an electro larynx. Even though the skin and tissue under here was rock hard. We tried a couple of times, and lo and behold, a darling emerged. Hello, how are you? I was dumbstruck. I couldn't figure out how to no larynx. But this thing being called vocal cords and I can still talk them through here. I might have been done for trouble, but I was overjoyed. I had a chat with my consultant about the hospital situation. And he said to me one day, it's so sad. But with all the hospital jobs, I'm afraid that we are way down the list when it comes to funding. So I said to him, well, what would make your difference? Do you own what you do? He said, well, what we really need is the brand new video Rhino Laryngoscope. Show me this picture of this wiggly waggly thing. I said, right, you save my ass. We'll get you one. I got a little go out and get it. And that's how the charity started. We started off with little brown envelopes collecting 20 bees in the hospitals. Got some collection tubs. 
Dez um mais dois. Dois dois. E após os dois aqui tem. Da vez não é legal para ver. Tem lá de cada. I'm presented. My surgeon with the money to buy. This flashy video line of the ringer's rope. Say I told you it was longer than the first one. Now I told him we had trouble communicating obviously. So we devised a symbol. Tap tap means no. Tap 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 means yes. Easy way to communicate. Drive to and talking, me to and talking. Sorry, I've got it all written down in order here. I was able to do a PowerPoint presentation, but the only PowerPoint I know is an electric socket, which I know how to feel with my That we found. That the public awareness of these sorts of cancers is virtually nil. In fact, we did a street survey in a reasonably sized town near Leicester. And I was flabbergasted because 87% of the people we talked to did not know you could get cancer above the shoulder line. Now I find that incredible. Because of this area, from close upwards, there are 30 or probably more different types of cancer, and they all cause what's on this banner. They all cause stress. So you need to be seen, and you need the awareness to be there immediately. You need patients to be heard faster, but less stress. Patients treated earlier, less stress. These can lead to a possibly simpler operation on affected parts. And on we go downwards, I won't read them all out. But if we ever go to a show or an event, we take some of our roller banners with us. And quite a few people take notice. Mainly because they know my situation now, so they take notice of me. Because I've got now quite a notoriety in the pub. I'm the only darling in the village. Which I suppose is how I'm running going to that. I might offend somebody, I usually do. Now I mentioned the wife earlier, and that brings in carers. They do an absolutely superb job because carers learn faster what's needed and what isn't needed for a laryngectomy than anybody else. I've been in hospital, we could say a fair number of times, but half the time they slap an out of your mouth straight on me fizz up, over my nose, over my mouth. And if I'm able, I, I take it straight off and stick it over the other end and smile at them. When they look at me gone out, they don't understand. Nurses have a basic training, but laryngectomy nurses have a specific training. And if I ever get rushed into hospital now or just throw me out of the court, they know I'm Ward 17, respiratory, I'm our Lord is him again. Get the oxygen ready, get the mask ready, the tracky mask. Not the facial mask. Because they've learned and they understand. And, and I went there and gave them a bit of a talk one day. Just to explain the differences. Now did you know, we did a, another survey. And 63% of doctors didn't know the difference between a draggy and a larry. That's not a bad guy for somebody who's done God knows how many years training and God knows how many patients I've seen. But that's very true. So we need awareness spread there. 
I try and get our little video, not this one, but another little video in the Dodgers surgeries. All around Leicester, but it's very, very difficult. But because we now deal with the head and neck. Mainly it's well, but head and neck. We are now getting into a few dental surgeries. Because obviously it's the dentist when they do the jackups and the gums, valid, room and mouth, tongue. They can, I mean, they can't diagnose tonsil cancer, but they can certainly spot signs of abnormalities. And not a bad word for this time of the day. So it all helps. So the word is spreading, but it's very, very, very slow. And we need something to shake this world up. Because in Britain alone, there are over 8,000 laryngectomies. But we need a voice. So who's going to be the voice? I've got a voice. Thanks to surgical brilliance. But, mm, I can take on the back of our t-shirts. We are the cancer that nobody listens to. And that's wrong. Sure, I'm getting out of both. I think this conference is a brilliant, brilliant innovation online because it gets the word out to all parts of the world. We don't, or we can't do a great deal with our little charity, but we are growing and we. Excuse me. We are getting bigger and bigger, month by month. But is the awareness right that it needs to be out there? Now we obviously we've got the blue wristbands, 2020 boys guns, which we get in pubs and clubs. We've got the ledge and top we display what we do. We send our free newsletters to whoever wishes to be involved, and we welcome them, everyone. We have uh, sort of joint forces with Atos Medical, where the situation we're very, very proud of, as they can get the word out about us as well. I mean, they deal with, they've just taken over countrywide supplies, who deal with the medical needs of. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of laryngitis. So it all helps. It is a growing network. And as I said at the beginning, Chris Gert is just going to ask me to join in this conference with a PowerPoint. And I'm on about PowerPoints. This is a miracle I'm doing this on a video thing, whatever it is. Awareness has to start at the very, very beginning. Now, just because everybody goes to the doctor with a sore throat doesn't mean they've got throat cancer, mouth cancer, tonsil cancer, or any other cancer. But doctors need to be very aware that this is a distinct possibility because you leave it and leave it and leave it. And I'm afraid you can get to a situation where, yes. ENT can do something, but when they go in, they find it spread. And that's not what we want. We need this. Early doors. Early diagnosis, look. The key, without doubt. And it is the key, early diagnosis. And John Green would say it's only the same as far as Swallows UK are concerned as well. And he's got a far, far bigger network than we have. Now what we do, we produce a monthly newsletter, it's free. For anybody who's interested in what's going on in the Larry world. Because believe you me, it is a different world. 
me know. Let me give you an instance when I when I first got my beer. Yeah. I thought I'd say to the missus, let's go out and have a dinner. Let's go and celebrate, why not? One of the time I was girlfriend's blood in a lot. Because I still got lots of big mucus building up in my chest and as you do. So we ended up sitting in the corner of the restaurant with her face in the restaurant and me face in the wall. Because when I started coughing and spluttering, or even spoke with this, the number of people that sit there and stare, they wonder where this darling boy's come from. I mean, if I hadn't been coughing and spluttering, I'd have just simply said, I will exterminate. <laughs> now they shut them up. But I was too busy doing me breathing exercises to worry about exterminating anyone. But that did show me just how many uncharitable people and ignoramuses to this actual disease there are in this world. And I'm in a room of, say, 40 people all merrily eating away. If I started my coughing and swaddling and drawing Half of them, literally 20 of them, 25 of them, I'd be looking around, where's that coming from, what's that? Oh my goodness. Well, way good people, these things happen. And one woman actually said to the manager of a restaurant, I don't believe you let people like that in here. And I was straight up, jumped on the shoulder and said, lady, there, but for the grace of God, go I, think about it, and she went all bright red and scarred. See, they don't expect that. We've lost the boys, but why should we be silent? We can't be silent, because there are so many more to come. I mean, in the medical world, the sign there's a big university in America, I forget where it is. But they did a massive, massive survey on laryngectomies. Seemingly three percent were caused by the HPV virus. That's true. Twelve percent. Or the third, no, thirteen percent were caused by alcohol. Twelve percent by smoking. That upset the Andes when they weren't top of the list. And there's two percent where the the cause is totally unknown. And when they tried to work out how this HPV came top of the tree, they did an age analysis thing. So of course all the golden oldies were around in the sixties and seventies. The so called the area of free love and the Saturday that S D and God knows what else. They blamed sexual relationships. For HPV, they probably had a point. I just miss my share. But it proved, beyond any reasonable doubt, that the anti smoking brigade were talking out their glutamus maximus because they promoted cancer of the mouth, cancer of the throat, as a the all and all of causation smoking, and it's not. Still, we all know the government departments lie and bend the truth to do themselves over the last part of by. Now then, we go back to this awareness question. Now how do we actually promote awareness? Well, both follows and us of various events not so much at us at the moment, and whenever we do, we bring out the big guns, like these roller bars, so that people can read, digest, take in what it's all about. Because a lot of people do not understand the slightest what a turmoil this is, what a shock in the system. I mean, how can you go into a hospital one day and come out the name one and come out, but be in bed the next day with no voice, no communication. 
Things are horrendous. Things are all of this. I say to everyone who talks to me or emails me on their Gmail address, by the way. And then, at 2020 voice guns are done to You must stay positive. Positivity and awareness are the two major key points in my book. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what the situation is. Think positive. Do not think negatively. The doctors, the surgeons, the nurses, SLTs, everybody involved, even a dietitian, will do everything they can to help you. You haven't got to do this alone. They wouldn't allow you to do this alone because they themselves know what a horrendous journey this really is. I mean, as I said at the beginning, it took me almost four years to get over this before I started the charity. 2020boyscancer.org Let's keep looking at it. I had complications. And that's how long it took me to get on my feet. Feel well enough and strong enough. To set this up. Thankfully, we're going in an upward spiral. And that's the way to go. And now while this is well founded, when I'm gone, I know this will carry on through others as they are learning and seeing what it does to me. Right, remember, positivity, awareness. I'm not gonna keep waffling on. I think I've told you enough of our situation, what we do, where it all starts and where it all ends. When it ends, I simply with a very happy jabby like me talking to you. Enjoy the rest of your conference. And hopefully, I may get the odd email or two from you, and thanks very much Chris for giving me this opportunity to speak to, to the World Council Conference. Cheerio all. I saw a patient the other day. I said, sorry, but you got six months to live. He said, I don't think I could have paid my bill for another 12 months anyway. I looked at his chart, I said, I think you got 12 months to live. Hello, my name is Rebecca Spurn. I'm a dietitian with Northwell Health, Department of Radiation Medicine. I work with outpatient oncology patients. I think that it's really important and beneficial for a patient with head and neck cancer to work with a dietitian because in the situation that a cancer patient is in, there are many, many things that are out of your control. But how a person chooses to manage their nutrition and what they eat is something that they can control. And this is something that dietitians can be really helpful with. When I'm working with a cancer patient, my two main focuses are to try to help them manage their symptoms and to also try to help them get the calories and protein and fluids that they need to get through the treatment as strong as possible. And I think that every head and neck cancer patient who is affected so much by their treatment, because of the nature of the treatment, it really affects their ability to eat. And I think that we as dietitians can be so helpful in maximizing a person's ability to get the nutrition they need to be as strong as possible throughout their treatment. In addition, I think that dietitians can be really helpful in teaching healthy eating habits and not the least of which, we can also be very supportive emotionally for all the challenges that patients are encountering. The University of Edinburgh's Centre for Regenerative Medicine would like to take you behind the scenes of our research. Join me, Dr. Elaine Emerson, for a special virtual tour of my laboratory and to find out more about our research into new treatments for patients recovering from radiotherapy. Mucosamine mouthwash is a soothing mouthwash designed to become part of your usual daily dental routine. 
it's not always practical to carry the mouthwash around with you, so Mucosamin Oral Spray comes in a convenient 30ml bottle with a long nozzle to help you get those hard to reach areas in your mouth for fast targeted relief when and where you need it. Hi, it's Colin, I'm out of the house. Just wanted to come and say hi, I did it. Hi. Now Mike's gone, I can take that off. Uh, it's Toby from Dr. Hess, just wanted to say hi and thanks to uh, Sharon and Chris for letting us come and say uh, hello on this virtual conference. Um, sorry we can't be there today, but i really looking forward to next year, so hopefully we can meet each other face to face again. Have a great conference and see you again soon. Cheers then. Hi everybody. My name is Mark Lawler and I'm from Queen's University in Belfast. I'm Scientific Director of DataCan, the UK's health data research hub for cancer. We see data as being a little bit like oil and just like oil it needs to flow and then we can use that data to help us in earlier diagnosis of cancer and in providing better treatments for cancer patients. Despite having no symptoms whatsoever, somebody sits in front of you and says, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Colgrove, that you have prostate cancer. I have a routine blood test every year, and then I had the MRI, and that's when they found a P-shaped tumour in me. In fact, it was through you that I found out about proton therapy. The actual treatment with the protons takes less than two minutes aside, and that's quicker than a slice of toast. Seeing the tech and the facilities is all fine and it's smart and it's plush, but that counts for nothing if the people aren't giving you a feeling of security and support. And that's what the Rutherford Centre did so well. Oh, flipping heck. <laughs> Hi, I'm Liam from Flynn Health. We know that most patients undergoing radiotherapy treatment will suffer some kind of skin reaction to this treatment, which is why Flamagel RT is clinically proven to reduce the effects of radiotherapy induced skin reaction. Over 90% of patients say that it soothed the pain and the heat from their reaction with its cooling effect and it reduces the intensity of that red, dry, itchy, irritated skin. And it's easy to apply. It's not sticky or greasy, and it dries on the skin very quickly, allowing you to get dressed and get on with the rest of your day. So that brings the International Head and Neck Cancer Conference to a close. It's been a great honor to host the event, and our thanks go to the Swallows Charity and the sponsors of the event, who made it possible. We thank the speakers for the time they've invested in presenting over the last two days and I hope that over the next few years you get the opportunity to visit Edinburgh and we look forward to seeing you in 2021 in Cardiff. Yes, that's right. We are delighted to confirm our conference in 2021 will be hosted in the wonderful city of Cardiff the capital of Wales, it is the United Kingdom's 11th largest city. You'll never be short of ideas and inspiration while visiting this wonderful city and the conference will again be full of international speakers and lots of laughter. Our conference president will be Mr David Owens, a consultant ENT surgeon at the University Hospital of Wales. Hello from sunny Wales, I'm Dave Owens, a consultant head and neck surgeon working at the University Hospital of Wales. Together with the Non-Surgical Cancer Centre for Lindra Health Board, we treat just under 200 new head and neck cancer cases per year and serve a population of just over 500,000 people. 
as part of a larger South East Wales head and neck cancer network with our sister health boards, we treat around 750 new head and neck cancer cases per year in a population of around 1.5 million. Here at the University Hospital, we are preparing for a second wave of COVID-19. You can see construction of our new 400 bed surge hospital is rapidly progressing. With this development, we feel that we'll be able to meet the challenges of a pandemic spike without a major effect on our elective workload. I hope you're enjoying this year's virtual conference so far. I'm delighted that Cardiff will host a 2021 event. The conference will allow us to showcase the excellent care and innovation seen in the diagnosis, treatment and ongoing care given by the Head and Neck teams of Wales. It is an enormous honour for myself and the wider Head and Neck community in Wales to have Cardiff chosen as a venue for the 2021 conference. I can't promise the weather will be better than now, but pandemic willing, you will receive a warm, if not dry welcome, and I look forward to seeing you all here. Thank you everybody, and we can now go live to Boston, USA, and to Arthur Loretano, and is looking forward to hosting the question and answer session. It's over to you, Arthur. Uh, the conference has been amazing, so I first want to give a shout out to Chris and Sharon, uh, who have just done a phenomenal job in the work that the Swallows does, as, as I'm sure you can see. Uh, we missed getting together this year. I will say I went to a pub the other night and had fish and chips, uh, just in honor of the conference. Uh, Chris was able to furlough me for a couple of days from the asylum so I could uh, be at the conference, and I'll have to go back this afternoon. But that being said, we've just had a tremendous team here. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Chris for a moment, and then we'll get to the questions. Oh, my God, Ben. Only you could come on with a radiotherapy mask and a lightsaber. God, what are you going to do next year in Cardiff? I hope it's not going to involve any sheep. So no. <laughs> I'm just going to say a few words before we start. Um, anyone that's still out there listening after two days would be fantastic. But any of the health professionals that have been listening, we have got a, a certificate of attendance. All you've got to do is send an email to Sharon at theswallows.org.uk and she'll send you a certificate of attendance. And I know a lot of the health professionals like that for their files. So please make sure you send that in. Um, I've also was going to mention Cardiff, but obviously you all know now that Cardiff is next year, unless Ian gets his way and we're going to redo it in Edinburgh. Um, so the other thing I'd like to just mention quickly is, you know, um, that last speaker we had, um, Phil was really, really worried about talking at a conference like this. And do you know what? I've just said on, on YouTube, and I'll say it to his face, and I'll say it now live, he's done a phenomenal, phenomenal um, session. And do you know what? I always get asked the questions whenever we put a, a laryngectomy patient on, should we have subtitles? And my answer is always no. It is up to us to listen harder. It's not for them to apologize for being a laryngectomy and having to have subtitles. I'm sorry, whenever I do a conference or I ever do any talks, you will never get me putting subtitles up because I don't think that is respecting the person that's speaking. So if anyone has got any thoughts about subtitles, don't even bother sending me any messages because I'll just delete them. So I needed to say that. And I'm now going to pass over to the wonderful Arthur, who has again been up since 3 a.m. this morning. He looks as fit and, and as good looking now as he did at 3 a.m. his time. I don't know what he's drinking or what he's doing, but let's all get over to America. So I'll over, over to you, Arthur. Lots of coffee. Lots of coffee. So let's see, I just wanna make sure we have everyone, all of our participants are here. Um, so we got a series of questions and uh, Chris sent those to me and then I have a few of my own if we get time for them. So the first one's for Emma uh, from Derek, a great service for patients, much needed. However, many of the patient's psychological effects also affect caregivers. Do you include them in your treatment, Emma? 
Well, yeah, the, our service will very much be for the patient and for the and for the family or caregiver. Where we see it as a as a whole. Um, we certainly also offer the hope course for carers. Um, so we we do lots of signposting as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, again, for you, Emma from Ross, who uh, gave a great talk herself yesterday. She says, "Thanks for a great talk." Uh, what about patients who are unable to access this wonderful service in person? Are you prepared to assist them online um, from only, and if so, from only local areas or from further afield? Well, obviously, for funding purposes, sadly, we're only allowed to actually see patients or even do video consultations with patients who are actually in the Nottinghamshire area under Nottinghamshire GP. However, we never turn a patient away. So we have many patients from up and down the country um, who are not under our, in our CCGs, um, but we always give them advice um, either via email or still talk to them over the phone. It's just that we can't actually then access their actual treatment plans and their actual treatment data. Great, thank you. Uh, Alex, also a question from Derek. Uh, OMG, the service is exactly what I have been calling for, for <laughs> caregivers as well as patients. Uh, where is it? And um, I think Chris mentioned it was mentioned in the chat, but if you could just let everybody know how they can access the service that you provide. Yeah, so ours is based in Nottingham. Um, and at the end of the talk, there is an, um, an email address that you can email. And I would also signpost to services that may be available in your area. Um, as I alluded to in the talk, um, this is something that as for the College and Society of Radiographers, we want to have a national um, coverage of this for all patients who are suffering with late effects of treatment. So, oh, you know, in time, this will be building and there will be access, hopefully, for all patients. Okay, great. And uh, Alex, uh, let's see, where are you? Same question to you. Yes. Where are you um, offered? And, and for us, um, uh, for us uh, in the UK, the, um, uh, as I was sort of describing the kind of presentation, the pathway usually kind of involves uh, the clinical nurse specialists initial uh, kind of engagement and assessment with the issues and distress that the patient's facing. Um, now, whether they then have the benefit of a cancer specialist team uh, or sort of psychological care specialists kind of attached to them, the CNS can um, uh, refer to if necessary, that is not universal, but it's pretty frequent. So uh, in most uh, cancer center, it's certainly in all cancer centers and in most cancer treatment hospitals, uh, there will be uh, some access to cancer specialty psychological care. Uh, and the first kind of uh, action is to discuss those issues with the nurse specialist. Um, it is um, uh, kind of very often, um, kind of, it is very often the case that that will then kind of launch further care, but it's also kind of quite possible that that will be a sufficient level of support. Arthur, can I just come in there? Yes, sir. Um, we've, been roll, we've been running a poll since you spoke, Alex, because of the feedback we've been getting. And the question was, um, should your service be embedded into the pathway from the point of diagnosis? And you'll be... You won't so, be surprised. You won't be surprised to see that a hundred percent of the poll said it should be embedded from the point of diagnosis. Now I've come to see you at your hospital, and I know that you are embedded into that service from the point that people get diagnosis. And I always remember a quote you said to me is that you stop patients getting to the severe state, which then saves people money. And the NHS is all about saving money. So the poll says you should your service should be embedded. Um, the financial says it should be embedded. And it's something for 2021 with your help and maybe Emma's help that we can look at running some sort of campaign and some sort of results around that to try and get your service embedded, both for patients and, as Derek always reminds me, caregivers as well. So thanks for letting me say that. Uh, uh. So one um, uh, on that kind of um, matter, one thing that might kind of help as a as a tool, really, when people are trying to kind of uh, uh, understand how to set up services and how to commission them, uh, and I'll kind of put the link in the, in the chat here, and, and maybe kind of Chris, you can throw it into the uh, into the feed as well as a kind of um, uh, the the most recent sort of comprehensive guidance 
on commissioning psychosocial care for cancer and those principles of it being specialist and embedded, uh, accessible to all patients and cares throughout the pathway. Uh, and that, you know, there's a whole system of integrated system. Uh, it isn't just about sort of psychological care, explicit psychological care, uh, but a series of interventions, including, um, you know, uh, groups and activities and sort of peer support, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that is, uh, that might be a helpful starting point for people who are looking to develop uh, uh, or make the case locally and includes uh, the business cases, uh, templates that can be used. Great, thanks. Ben, I'm going to switch over to you. Um, so uh, the, what's, the what's my why was just a tremendous thing. I have to say, I follow Ben on uh, Facebook and he is just so motivational. You know, he's done a great job getting in shape, the positivity. And um, in fact, you can probably all speak to this, but I, I think positivity in somebody undergoing treatment, any type of treatment is huge. I'm sure Alex has seen that. One of the things we dread in medicine is when a patient comes into the hospital and says something to the effect of, I think I'm going to die during this admission. Um, it, it's, you know, we say that that's a bad omen, but the reality is it probably speaks to that person's mindset about not being willing to move on and fight. So, um, Ben, tell me about the positivity. What is your sense of going into treatment and then coming through it on the survivorship side with, uh, you know, having this positive attitude that you have and how can you spread it to others? I mean, I know you do anyway, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Arthur. Really kind words there. I, it's just something that you need to do. If I uh, pick up on what you just said, if you think you're going into treatment and you're probably going to die, I think you're probably right. You will. It's mindset. You need to set out where you think you're going to be and then find your route to, uh, to achieve it. Uh, it's not always easy. It's tough. Uh, if I look at Alex's presentation today, if I look at Emma's presentation today, uh, I could tick off about 90% of the things those guys were talking about. Yes, I have down days. Um, the physical elements, uh, crumbling teeth, uh, memory loss, hearing uh, is playing me up. Yeah, I got it. But it's better than the being here is better than the alternative. Alex, your thoughts on that? Going into treatment with positive attitude. Yes. So you know, it is um, kind of it's worth kind of um, putting a little bit of sort of detail in that, in the sense that you know, kind of having moments uh, of kind of sort of distress or kind of questioning or kind of you know not feeling kind of fully strong or hopeful is kind of part of the normal experience. Usually there is moments of that as well as moments of kind of quite positive self-talk, uh, quite kind of hopeful out outlook, quite a sort of um, uh, a determined kind of idea. So people can hold both. Uh, in our experience, you know, you don't have to be unyieldingly kind of 100%. You can allow yourself some kind of difficult moments uh, without that kind of compromising your, your kind of overall drive. Uh, equally, I think what we want to look out for is people who are kind of persistently kind of lacking any sense of kind of drive, optimism, hope, um, who, as you sort of said, Arthur, kind of sort of come into thinking, I'm really not going to make it because that is unusual. Uh, and it sort of probably is a sort of a good sign of actually there's a sort of a deeper sense of uh, kind of helplessness, hopelessness, sort of despair. Um, and that might actually come out in terms of people's uh, behavior, engagement in care, engagement in rehab, engagement with what they need to do. So, you know, fight, but in a very specific way uh, and therefore kind of compromise their outcomes. So I think we, we should really pay attention to when it's sort of pervasive, but equally we should be very compassionate and understanding if it's kind of part of the emotion that comes with it. Great, thanks. So, Emma, I'll go over to you. What have you seen with the attitudes of people regarding their um, survivorship journey, their post-treatment journey, uh, you know, engaging them versus finding them hard to engage? You might be on mute. Oh, you are. Yeah. You're still muted. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> That's the practice um, one. <laughs> um, it really it varies really from patient to patient um I'd, the patients that i'm picking up on the um who are on the prom program who are automatically being followed up respectively um 
these patients, because I'm addressing them, they tend to often have much more of a much more of a positive outlook. That they feel that their um, late effects and their survivorship journey, excuse me, survivorship journey is actually being addressed already. When the patients first come to the late effects clinic, they usually are at rock bottom if they're a referral in because they're usually at that crisis point. Pay- like alluded to in the presentation, often patients aren't referred until they get at crisis point, which is too late, which is why we set the problems programme up. So we really have to work hard at trying to get them engaged. But patients, once they often they know me in the first place anyway, know that we were there during treatment. We really do have this rapport and can really help to get them back onto where they need to be. But it is hard work trying to get them to see that, you know, we can improve things or at least help them to accept how to live better with how they've been left after treatment. Great, thank you. Um, can you mention about, uh, you talked about proms, uh, you know, and um, a couple of people have asked, uh, in particular Stephanie Cleaver, just how they can get some information from you because they want to set it up at their own institution. Yeah, if they want to email me, the, that's the best way because then we can have a have a chat about it where they're at, um, because there's lots of work nationally going on about around proms. Great, thank you. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. I want to go over to Joanna. She is uh, Joanna Knight. I'm correct. Uh, hospital community development specialist for Capitex Healthcare. Um, and I believe um, you sponsored Phil's talk. Is that correct? I think. Yeah, um, we, we just distribute the, um, the Surbox electric electro larynx. Wonderful. Uh, within the UK. Great. What other, um, is that the main thing you guys do? The, the it, no, it's, well, it's one of them. We've uh, we've just launched um, a new laryngectomy range um, on prescription. So base plates, laryngectomy tubes, um, <clears throat> stoma buttons, but um, have quite a lot of features that are very different from anything else currently available. <clears throat> Can you uh, enlighten me? So here in the US, <laughs> we have an extremely hard time getting electro uh, larynxes for patients. I have two patients right now that we are struggling to get them. And then obviously we have to get them paid for, which means we'll probably take funds out of our charity uh, fund that I mentioned yesterday that we use for tube feeds. We use it for cab vouchers to get people back and forth to radiation uh, and dental care, which is also not covered. So um, I mean, it, it varies very much within the UK. In some hospitals, all patients get one straight after surgery. That doesn't happen um, right across the board. Um, it very much comes down to funding. I know in the UK, some hospitals, um, they, they incorporate the price of a Cervox in with the price of the surgery. Um, that's not very common, but I think if that was done more often, um, it would give every patient the opportunity to have that voice straight after surgery. I think lack of a voice um, is, is just so, and I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir here, um, it's so debilitating just, you know, uh, mentally to come through a big surgery like that and not be able to express yourself. And, you're, you know, especially now with masks on, we're trying to mouth words and people can't understand them. And, um, you know, I find it very disheartening. I also find that when, and I'm sure Ian can speak to this too, you find that when patients first come out of surgery, they're, they're you know, they're still a little drowsy and you give them a clipboard to write on. And it looks like my handwriting. I mean, you know, I have doctor's handwriting. You can't read a thing. And, and I feel really bad for them. And there's this huge frustration. The boogie boards are great. Uh, usually there's too much swelling in the neck usually initially to use the electrolarynx. And I, I can tell you when I'm seeing patients and I'm hoarse from a cold, I, I feel like I just cannot express myself. And, and I think about my laryngectomy patients. So, um, Arthur, what I'll do is, Arthur, I, I am dealing with the equivalent company in America that Capitex put me in touch with. And um, they are very keen to help and support charity funds to get patients their voice. So I'll put you in touch with them as well. Great. Thank you. Can, can I just say regarding the, the Servox Digital, um, it does something very different from any, any of the other electrolarynxes on the market. And that's that it comes with software that enables the clinician to save the patient's pitch and tone now, the reason that's so important is once a patient, they've already lost their voice once. And once they've established a very good voice with an electrolarynx, if that ever got broken or needed replacing, to take that voice off a patient a second time is absolutely devastating. So with, with the new digital that's come out, um, the clinician can actually save um, the exact settings on their laptop um, and should that should the patient ever need another one they can just plug it in and reset it exactly the same and I think that's invaluable 
um, to any laryngectomy patient. Great, thanks. Ian, any thoughts on that from your standpoint? Yeah, that's very interesting. Do you take a voice print before surgery? Is that how it's done? Or? Well, the, the speech and language therapist would get to know the patient very well beforehand, so they would have an idea of the patient's voice. Um, and what, what we'd recommend is when when the patient's being taught how to use the Servox is that the partner or a very close family member would come in with them so they can help as they're adjusting the pitch and tone and volume, et cetera, until they get it exactly right. Of course, most of our patients are aiming for a tracheosophageal valve prosthesis, really. Yes. But, um, you know, I think we're seeing, uh, certainly in the UK, a swing away from primary laryngectomies to our salvage as people go for organ preservation strategies. And so it can be more difficult or impossible to use valves in some settings, particularly when you've got bulky flaps and things like that. So some people do rely on those mechanisms, of course, and the more natural that can sound, you know. And I think during, during COVID, with a lot of the clinics being closed, a lot of patients weren't able to get, get the valves changed and they were, you know, they were left without voices. So, um, you know, to have one of these at home for situations like that, um, I think it's, you know, to have no voice at all must be devastating yeah. for, any, for anybody. I think that's a major problem still for a lot of people. If they're having valve problems now, it's very difficult to access services who are happy to see them and to change them because the, the just I know locally that our capacity has really gone down and that's been seen as an extremely high risk procedure fundamentally because of the amount of coughing and aerosolization that's involved with a, with a valve change. So um, that's a problem. I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will be having difficulty with that at the moment. Yeah, well, that's a great point. And it's interesting when I come to the UK, I'm always amazed at how many more laryngectomy patients there are because we switched over to, you know, salvage a long time ago, a lot of upfront chemo and radiation. In fact, I've had a couple of patients where they really didn't even have the indication, but they refused to have a laryngectomy. And then you end up taking out their voice box and um, they do have a lot of complications because of radiation, higher risk of fistula, they have had flaps. And, you know, when you put a TE puncture on those patients and then it breaks down in some cases, you end up with a huge mess. So um, it, it is something to kind of be prepared for as you move more towards salvage. Um, I want to switch to Alex right now again. So when I was a resident, actually when I was an intern, uh, right out of medical school, one of the most important things I was taught was feel free to call for help, but just remember, calling is a sign of weakness. And I think what happens is we have, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's definitely a mentality in the United States, but I can't think of too many cultures where it's not, where there is a fear to seek out psychological therapy. There is, there is a stigma, um, you know, as we see in the United States with mental health in general. And um, how do we, you know, what's the best way to try to engage patients into the process of, of making sure they take care of themselves and caregivers because I, I hopefully Derek is still on and I know he's such a proponent for caregivers I really respect that so you know to provide that psychological need and to show that it's not a stigma it is something that more people should do and, and as a corollary do you see um, not so much cultural but an age difference where maybe younger people are more willing to do it yeah um, I think there's um, just to kind of pick up on, on that kind of, sort of last point, um, it is indeed more likely that um, you will find uh, the people who kind of more actively reach out for kind of help, help or support are sort of younger. Uh, indeed, there's more, usually there's more, uh, the distress is more prevalent the, the younger you are because it's more disruptive to your role, identity, and sort of life. You, you, you haven't got that written into the script uh, that you're gonna have um, a health problem. So it's kind of much more disruptive and sort of devastating. And I think probably you're, you know, that also kind of motivates uh, people to sort of seek more help. Uh, with older people, kind of distress is sort of more prevalent. And also the ideas you mentioned about, um, you know, sort of resilience, kind of stigma, uh, the sense of kind of, uh, how can um, how can kind of talking possibly help? Uh, it's certainly not universal. So uh, a lot of the people we see will be kind of older and and have great benefit and access kind of care. I think the way of um, sort of accessing things is goes back to what Chris was sort of saying is to make them as as embedded as possible, so that it doesn't require some sort of referral to another center. Uh, so our clinic room is next to our oncologist clinic room. 
uh, and uh, our kind of um, our our sort of um, uh, discussions with the CNS has kind of happen regularly, so that it doesn't really feel like kind of another system of care you have to be referred to. Uh, and I think if all the research kind of shows that pe people usually pre prefer the psychosocial care to be really, really embedded with their cancer care. Uh, so I think reducing barriers, embedding kind of psychological care, uh, and also looking at kind of the non-specialist thing. So if you can actually provide psychological care without needing a specialist, psychologist, social worker, psychiatrist to kind of provide it, uh, whether that can be your, your kind of very uh, well-attuned doctors, your nurses, your radiographers, your speech and language therapists, um, you know, kind of starting the conversation about well-being. Um, I think those are the kind of components I would, I would like to see. Yeah, I agree, definitely. Uh, Emma, what is your sense as you're working on the survivorship, uh, you know, course with patients and really helping them, especially with long-term effects? How often are you seeing that there are, you know, significant issues with depression, anxiety, things like that, you know, well afterwards, uh, survivor's guilt, all these different things that we see. And how often do you find you have to refer people? Uh, very common. Um, however, we, we don't we have need to find the need to refer too many patients on to um, the psychologist, basically because the, the team that we've got here in Nottingham have been trained to really quite a high standard, have got the key skills um, that Alex was just talking about, and we use them in everyday practice. So myself and the on-treat um, information support radiographer, Sarah Lambert, uh, you know, she's excellent at picking up patients who are starting to struggle on treatment. And then we just make sure that they're kept an eye on afterwards. So we really start to embed it earlier on in the process um, to ensure that it continues all the way throughout. And also we've got fantastic clinical nurse specialists as well. Um, who have also had um, training, um, to, you know, to a high level to be able to. So it's a collective, really. So it's being drip fed to the patients all the time. Great. Thanks. So Ben, talking about the, you know, what I, what is actually um, in, in the United States, there was a there's a hospital called the Deacon. It's part of the Beth Israel now where I trained, and um, they started something ages ago called the Mind Body Institute. Uh, they were really ahead of the curve in terms of addressing the fact that it's hard to make people physically better if they're not mentally better. So, uh, two questions for you. One is, um, you know, as someone who's gone through the treatment, how Prepared, did you feel for any psychological uh, aspects and supported, you know, what was available to you if you needed it? And then secondly, just your ideas on the mind-body concept. Uh, to be honest, I had very little support going through this. The Macmillan nurse that was assigned to me was already overworked, stressed, and actually left the service. I don't think that was down to me, but who knows? Um, but no, she, she left during... Uh, just literally as I was finishing my treatment. So I never got a chance to meet a new Macmillan nurse. So everything has been pretty much what I've driven from it and how I've managed to get through this. The mind body element, I don't think I would have been able to do this if I'd been on my own. Uh, going through treatment, there were two gentlemen I went through treatment with. One was a week ahead of me, one was a week behind me. Uh, they would turn up on their own. They didn't have the support of their family. People weren't there with them during chemotherapy. And unfortunately, they're no longer with us. And I think that is because they didn't have the mental support to actually get through this. You do not realize just how grueling this is. Chris, I'm sure you've said, seen this time and time again from the number of people you talk to. It is, um, it's grueling destroys mentally and physically you come out the other side and i don't think you're ever really truly aware of the physical impacts it has on your body um you know here i am three years later and i'm still finding new side effects one day i'll enjoy something um steak for example one day i'll enjoy eating it the next day ah, may as well be chewing on chew, uh, chewing shoe leather it's just nothing so the importance is there. The work that Alex is doing really needs to be there. If we can get the work that Emma's doing there to actually spread that across so it's no longer just a postcode lottery, that would be amazing. Uh, I, th I think one thing that I could really sum this up, though, when life gives you lemons, make lemoncello. Yeah. <laughs> that's, well, that's, uh, better than lemonade, that's for sure. Uh, that's all right. Yeah. I, nah. um, Chris, your ideas on that? Yeah, the psychology side of Alex... I mean, I was so impressed when I went to meet Alex down in London. It was just, it, it was embedded in me that, you know what, I, God, I wish that was available. The problem is I did eventually get referred to a psychologist. 
but I didn't think I was mad. I didn't think I needed to go on a bench and just lay there and be, but it wasn't anything like that. And without that particular meetings that I used to go to every week, I don't think I'd have got through it as well. He started to make me understand what was happening to me. He started to make me realize that it was my brain doing a lot of the stuff and it wasn't really me. Um, and I started to accept where I was and what I needed to do to get out of it. And I think that was so, so valuable to me. We were lucky in Blackpool that it took me, I think, about seven days for me to get to see him. But once I got to see him, it was just almost an open invitation to, to go and see him or ring him. And it was, it was so good to have that. But I find from head and neck patients that call us on our 24-7, as well as carers, because they don't have that, that's why they ring us so much. That's why we have so many calls, because they don't want to talk to somebody else that is trying to tell them about their treatment. They want to be able to just express their thoughts and their fears. And, you know, Sharon takes them from caregivers. And, you know, we're both on that same journey, but on different tracks. And this psychological side is so, so important that we get it embedded within within every MDT. And I know that's a hell of a challenge, yeah. but patients and caregivers will so need it. And the work Emma does and Alex done, if we could do it as a showcase hospital, join those two together and we've got the perfect system to deal with late effects and psychology. And then if we can put Ben in every hospital, We'll all have a positive attitude. And you know what? It'll be like getting a broken arm. It will all just get over it. But on a serious note, I really struggled. So did Ben, so does everybody else in one form or another. And it's got to be addressed. And conferences like this allows us to address it. And if you all go back, whoever's out there as a health professional, and stop to think and start asking questions and don't accept the answers. And it's the old saying, we've got two ears and one mouth. Maybe start using them in that order. And that's what I'd say on the matter. That's a great point, Chris. You know, it's interesting. I've always gone by the, the Canadian physician, William Osler, who said that the good physician, or the good doctor treats the uh, disease, the great physician treats the patient with the disease. And one of the things I learned as I went over time was um, I had to force myself to have the conversations with patients about asking about their psychological needs. And now I do it regularly. And I ask the uh, caregivers, you know, I'll, I'll um, pull them aside even sometimes and, and just say, you know, how are things going? Uh, you know, is it stressful or whatever? Um, Derek asked a question along those lines for Alex as to, do you ever, um, you know, speak to the caregivers and particularly speak to the caregivers alone, because sometimes patients are really good at hiding issues. And I will say, at least in the United States with HIPAA rules, you have to, um, check with the patient first and say, can I speak with your uh, caregiver alone? And I'm sure that's the same everywhere. Um, and most people will agree to it. Some people don't. So Alex, your thoughts on that, you know, sort of getting a different yeah. perspective. Um, I, the, um, um, the value to cares can be sort of significant of having kind of a separate space uh, where um, they can sort of talk about their concerns uh, without sort of feeling, as was often in my experience, the case that uh, by kind of taking up the time in any other consultation, they're kind of taking up time or taking away attention or care uh, from their kind of loved one. So I think kind of creating a separate space is very valuable, uh, which and we, and we often kind of uh, are requested to do so, and we, we very happily offer it. Uh, often also people want to be together. Uh, and your and and that kind of joined up thing kind of allows them to work and talk to each other more openly. So your presence allows a kind of a, a, a freer discussion, a safer discussion, a more open discussion, and you facilitate that discussion. So you facilitate a communication, an exchange, and kind of collaboration between people who kind of have to deal with cancer as a unit, as a team. So you're kind of helping their teamwork, uh, but you might. Uh, also kind of help the care individually. Uh, and often that's kind of a very, very important because they might, and a very frequent sort of issue is when people come and say, uh, uh, you know, 
my kind of, uh, you know, my husband, my wife kind of, they seem kind of very, very positive. I'm absolutely dreading it. Uh, I'm really, really anxious and sort of scared. So they will often have very different emotional positions uh, and, and that'll make it difficult to talk uh, together. So uh, a separate space can be, you know, really quite valuable. Great, thank you. So at, so at, our, so at our monthly meetings before COVID come along, how, when we have our monthly meetings, we always have two rooms. We have a room for the patients and a room for the caregivers. And what we do is we bring them all together to start the meeting and we all have a chat and they're all chatting. And it's quite, it's quite eye-opening when you actually split them. When we split them and the carers go into one room and the patients stop in another, oh my God, the people that weren't talking suddenly talks and the dynamics and the conversations all change. And then, you know, when you go into the caregivers, they are just opening up so much and we had one patient that said, thank God she's gone out of the room. So we said, why? He said, because she's a, she has a real problem with depression and I have to be so positive through my treatment. It's killing me. But I don't know how to tell my nurse because every time they tell me something, I've got to say positive things back to her because otherwise my wife will fall apart. Yeah. So, you know, there are times when sometimes they need that separate area. And that's why we do it at our monthly meetings and it works really, really well. Um, so yeah, I do believe that there's times when they need separating for one reason or another. And, you know, most caregivers will ring Sharon between the hours of 10 at night and five in the morning. And that's because they've settled their patient down. The patient settled down for the night and now they're themselves are in that dark moment. And Sharon will take the call for maybe an hour at a time. And, you know, that's caregivers. Patients tend to ring me at different times of the day. But majority of carers are through those hours, which says that they need to talk to someone away from their patient. Yeah. So. Well, that's great, Chris. Thanks. Um, I got a specific question for Emma, and then I'm going to use that as a springboard to get into something else or something similar. So, Emma, there was a question as to uh, whether anyone's looking into the late effects of treatment at, here we go, Chris, Royal Derby Hospital, uh, not Derby, like we say in the United States. Uh, my mom is 20 years post oropharyngeal cancer surgery and had post op RT radiation therapy, radiotherapy. She's now experiencing swallowing difficulties. And the answer to that is absolutely. Derby have got exactly the same service um, that we have got in Nottingham. Um, and they've got some excellent speech and language therapists who are really specialising um, in long-term swallow effects. So um, you can either contact me and I can pass on details. That's absolutely fine. Or if you've got a contact number for somebody at Derby, then you'd be able to do it that way as well. Great, thanks. Emma, I'll put it, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, you'll know. perfect. Yeah, okay. Thanks. So along those lines, and I'm going to, as I said yesterday, I'm going to use a baseball term and go around the horn as is when you throw the ball from one base to another to another. Um, and uh, what I'm going to ask, I'll start with you, Emma, is um, so Phil's story was really, unfortunately, too common of one. Uh, he did have a tumor, which sounds like it was in a silent area. When you get ear pain, it's referred pain from a cancer, such as at the upper aspect of the voice box. The voice box cancers are interesting. If they happen on the vocal cord, if they're about a millimeter or two, they throw your voice off. But if they're above that, um, they don't change the voice, and sometimes it comes on really late. It sounds like his tumor was close to obstructing, um, and you know he ended up getting a trach, and in fact, probably lost some oxygen for a while, which is maybe why he cardiac arrested then ended up with a trach. And my sense from listening to him was that he seemed surprised that he woke up with that. So this is a long way of me saying, how well do you think clinicians prepare patients for um, some of the immediate potentials? Like, you know, I didn't even know I was going to wake up with a trach or long-term, you know, I'm 20 years out and now I'm having swallowing problems. You know, I thought I was past all this. So I'll go to you, Emma, first, and then I, I actually would like to hear from Ben and Chris and then uh, Ian and Alex. This, I think this is a really important topic that we don't necessarily prepare people well enough. Yeah, and I completely agree with you, um, Arthur. Um, 
certainly um, I think we are better now, certainly in the past five to ten years, I think we've got a lot better at, um, at, at, at telling patients um, what to expect. But I think the problem is we don't tell them what the impact they may have on their actual lives. So we're not always seeing patients. It's not often personalised enough to that patient. Um, certainly, um, I know I was speaking at a conference um, at the Head and Neck conference in York once, and this um, oncology said, well, I don't even tell patients that they're going to get a dry mouth because they're just going to get it. They didn't see it as being important. And I argued back and said, you know, well, most patients do get a dry mouth from having radiotherapy. He said, well, what would you say to patients? And I, I just think all patients need to know that life will be different afterwards. Now, that degree of how different, we actually don't know. Um, and obviously, we have to tell them about all the risks, but it's all the, if I say smaller effects, that doesn't mean the impact on the patient is any smaller, but what a clinician may see as smaller effect, they really have to be told to the patient in a way of how that would affect them if that was to happen to them. And we're hoping certainly with our proms work that we're going to get a real cohort of evidence to, to see what these some of the lower effects are that patients are maybe not presenting back with, but what are they actually experiencing at four to five months, one year, two year, three year, four year. But obviously it's going to be a while till we get all that data, but that's something that we're really trying to collect to then inform at consent. Great. Um, so Ian, I'm going to go to you next as a fellow clinician who, uh, you know, I, I know, for instance, when I straighten someone's deviated septum, I tell them there's a 70% chance their two front teeth will be numb for about a month afterwards. Some of my associates don't tell them that. And I always get phone calls on call. Why are my teeth numb? Whereas my patients will say, oh yeah, you told me that was going to happen. I know it'll go away. So there's a lot about expectations. Uh, go ahead, Ian, your thoughts. Sure. Well, expectation management is, is a lot of what we do as surgeons, isn't it? I mean, uh, yeah. you know, the, the, you would hope that somebody being put to sleep for a trach is aware, although he may have been acutely unwell at the time, so right. it can be difficult to, to and, we, and we, we touched on this before and in one of the, I can't remember which QA session now, we've done, we've done so many, uh, on the concept of the kind of informed consent, not just being a single moment, but being a continuum of discussion between patient and the, and the caregivers, uh, or the uh, clinical uh, team, I should say as well as, uh, you know, sticking to a kind of uh, consistent message throughout. In a practical terms, not telling somebody they're going to have a dry mouth, if that's your, if that's your position, you're going to spend a lot of time in the immediate post-treatment and the rest of, your, <laughs> rest of your clinic time telling them, oh, well, I should have told you this before. So you'd right. think that people would fall out of that. And yet it's a very unusual thing to not say. There are always kind of unexpected, there are unexpected things, which I, I, I find that, that patients are surprised by changes in taste that we don't tell them. Maybe we don't stress enough that they, they find we often maybe say you, you lose your sense of taste, you'll have a dry mouth. But, you know, again, I'm not an expert in this. I know that many of the people on this call know a lot more about the sensor, sensory changes they get, but the fact they can tolerate some foods and not others, it's frustrating to them that we're unable to tell them specifically why that would be or why it's different day on day, as Ben said. Um, so, you know, the predictable things are fairly easy to, to go over and really is remiss to not cover them. But my experience is there's quite a lot of unpredictable things which are difficult to cover uh, and that patients feel frustrated that they didn't know about, but it, it's difficult because it seems like there's quite an individual spectrum of responses to, the, uh, to, to treatment. Surgical things are kind of predictable, um, uh, but the chemotherapy and radiation side effects, they also change, of course, with time. And there are different waves, the acute, the, the medium term and the long term side effects. And in practice, it's, it's impossible to prepare somebody for everything. So you've got to kind of focus on the things that are most likely to be significant to them. And you would have thought dry mouth would be front and center, to be honest. Yeah. Alex, uh, I'm curious your thoughts on this. And, and, you know, in particular, I wonder how often you're sitting talking with someone and, and a lot of it is around the side effects that they've had now to change their lives. I mean, I feel like I know the answer to that already, but I'd like to hear it from you. Well, I, I kind of really, really feel for, uh, uh, you know, you guys kind of, uh, Ian, Arthur, you know, when you, uh, well, when you kind of have to explain things to people who, who sort of can't or don't want to hear, uh, so I kind of, in my mind, I kind of frame it as an invitation to to kind of understand. And I think kind of the sort of data that Emma would describe would be wonderful. It's like, can I invite, you know, 
would you be interested in kind of understanding a bit more about what, what happens sort of typically? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people are kind of really just say, listen, I just a bit too much for me. Um, they don't necessarily might sort of say it outright, but imply it that I just, just do what you need to do. Um, I think you know, we know that some people will lap it all up and, and be very, very sort of, you know, intellectually sort of prepared, although emotionally you can't entirely be prepared until it actually happens to you. Um, but other people will be very overwhelmed uh, and even if you offer that information, it will be kind of blocked or, or sort of skimmed or forgotten. So um, we have to respect that, that, you know, people's capacity to take in information depends on their ability to tolerate that anxiety and that uncertainty. And if it's too high, they will not take in the information. They will then later say, nobody told me. Uh, and and that's where I kind of think the task of the you know of the kind of clinicians trying to prepare people is very difficult, very sensitive, very intuitive. Uh, how much can this person take on today? Um, so the data is one thing, but the intuition and the kind of collaboration to invite people to take that on is critical. Yeah, I've noticed the same thing as well. I'll often say to patients, you'll probably remember about a third of what I said because I said you had cancer and you probably don't remember anything else and we'll bring them back and talk to them. So Ben and Chris, um, you know, obviously your thoughts along this line as to how prepared you felt and, and maybe a corollary to that, were there things that you've now learned in your journey are common things, not the unexpected as Ian was talking about and not the individual you know, individual approaches to things or, or the way people respond. But were the things that you said, boy, everyone has complained about this and I never heard about this from my doctor. Maybe the dry mouth, maybe, you know, stiffness in the neck. So uh, let's go to you, Ben, first. I, the cramps in the neck, nobody warned me um, how bad the cramps in the neck would be uh, ongoing. Even now, you know, as a PT, I'm quite fit, quite strong, but my God, when they kick in, it's debilitating. You just cannot move. Um, but I think coming back to what you were saying originally, how do you help people take it in? So if I was to play back to you, what I'm hearing is uh, you're sat there. Somebody says to you, you've got cancer. You're going to have chemo radiotherapy and you're going to have a dry mouth afterwards. You'd be like, hang on a moment. Well, let's stop there. I've got what? Yeah. And right. it's OK. We're bending that information that is not important. A dry mouth. So what? OK, let's focus on this bit of information that's right here, right in front of me. When does treatment start? How am I going to face this? How am I going to do that? This then comes on to the work that Emma's doing, that ongoing support afterwards. OK, that's now dealt with. Now, let's look at these other the other impact on my life and how that's going to be and how that's going to impact things moving forward. Uh, and I think that's where the help and support really needs to be. Great. Thanks. Chris, your thoughts? I'm glad I wasn't at that conference, Emma, when that guy said that to you. I really am, because I would have got six green crackers and told yeah. him to eat them in a minute, <laughs> see how many he got through. Oh, my God. Try living with dry mouth, and you would never say that. Mm. That is just, I've got, I'm glad I wasn't at that yeah. conference. Um, it was it was some years ago now we'll say we know we are talking a good few years ago but it, but even so you know but even, yeah, absolutely even so, i still hear it to this day that mm. you know dry mouth so well it's just dry mouth i've cured you of cancer you know when i get a 70 odd year old man said i wish i hadn't survived it because what well, it's been left but anyway that's another story but i do think at, at the point of diagnosis a bit like ben said at the point of diagnosis I think a lot of patients shut off. And I do think people like Ian and Arthur and all the other health professionals and people like him will tell you things, but you just don't take them in. Some people will. Some people will take every word you say, digest it, work it through and deal with it. But I would say 99% of people will just hear that word cancer. And then I remember it going like a blue screen and there's all this information coming into my brain and suddenly my brain just shuts off and then you've got to reboot again. And I think that's one of the problems. But I also think if you told everybody the extent of side effects, would they then go through the treatment? Yeah. And maybe not. And, you know, I have, I saw the list that Emma put up and I think it was a fantastic list. But one of the things I find is 
I feel like I'm being, I'm nine years down and I still feel like I'm being strangled. Yeah. I still feel like someone is strangling me all, all the time. And if I touch here, it actually feels like I'm touching around here somewhere because of all the knitting. And I had two neck dissections. So, of course, all those those nerves, ends, and everything else, are, they can't stitch those back in the right places. So everything around my neck is all over. And because I had two neck dissections, you lay me on a flat bed with no pillow. And so, so many times I go in a hospital for different examinations. They lay me on their normal bed with, that, with the paper towel, no pillow, and tell me to put my head down. And then a surprise, because A, I can't get it down properly. And B, when they ask me to get up, I'm like a turtle on my back. I can't get up. I've no strength in this neck to be able to pull myself up. Now, they're only little things, but it's embarrassing that, you know, there's all these people around and there I am laid there like a turtle and I can't get up. And they don't even realize why. And it, they're the sort of bits that are nine years down the line that affects me. My ability to eat and swallow and drink, you know, I've learned now what I can eat, what I can't eat. I don't get hung up on what I can't eat anymore. I used to do, but I don't bother anymore. And I celebrate what I can eat. Yeah. And every now and then I will try something I can't eat. And if I eat it, great. If I don't, then I don't worry about it. I'll try it again in the future. You know, and, and I think dry mouth is the big issue. I think the tightness around the throat, if you've had a neck dissection, is worse than the dry mouth. Because I honestly have to look around sometimes and think Sharon's strangling me. Yeah. Because, you know, that's how it feels. And as you get a cold or you feel tense, the muscles here, I have to, I have to try and get at least a massage once a month. Otherwise, I can't get through it. And when she massages me, she says she's never massaged anyone with so many lumps and bumps and tension in the back of the neck and up the neck. And they're little things, but you improve that by 1% and it's 100% improvement for me. Right. So when I'm asking for little things, you know, improve dry mouth by 1%, that's 100% for me. And if you improve the aches and pains, that's going to be a 100% improvement for Ben. And so it's all those little bits that help us get through as a patient. And I don't know whether we should be told all the information right at the beginning. I think I observe a lot of hospitals around the country. I get invited in to observe it from a patient's point of view when clinicians are telling patients. And I've, I've observed about five or six different clinics. And I have to say the best clinic I have ever seen is Richard Simcock. What he does from the minute you walk in as a patient, he records every conversation with every physician, with every department. And what they do at the end of your appointment is you sit in one chair and everyone comes to you and everything is recorded. And he says right at the beginning, don't worry about taking any of this information and don't write anything down. You'll be given a copy of every conversation today to take home and listen with your family and friends. When I then spoke to those patients afterwards, not one of them had that glossy eye information overload. They all said, well, I don't need to listen because I've got this and I'm going to listen at home in my own comfort. And I'm going to come back in two days with all my questions. How simple is that? Yeah. So then I asked another physician in another hospital, why don't you do that? I'm scared of getting sued. Yeah. I'm scared of getting sued. Well, I might say something that they'll sue me for. Then whatever they're going to sue you for, don't say it anyway. Surely it works the other way. Is if I'm going to sue you for not telling me, actually I did tell you because I've recorded it. Yeah. I just think that information overload has been a subject for, for nine years since me being involved in this wonderful world of head and neck cancer. No one's ever really addressed it apart from Richard Simcock. And I wish that people like Emma and Ian and everybody else could speak to Richard and say, tell me how you do it, because 
seriously from a patient's perspective and a carer, information overload is gone. So, yeah, yeah that's my point. Sorry. No, it's a great point. And I, I do think we have that balance, as Ian said, of you don't want to scare people away from having treatment. And at the same time, you want them to be prepared. Um, so speaking of preparation, I, I still see Joanna there. I'm going to bring you back into the conversation. See, no one, no one uh, escapes my vision. Um, so in terms of preparation, uh, you know, the, the whole voice recording idea, like you talked about, is interesting. Do you ever um, see people working with people who you know are going to have a laryngectomy to see, I, I know it's hard to use an electrolarynx when you still have a larynx, but just to get a flavor of what it's like. Has anyone done that where preoperatively they say, look, this is the device you're going to be using afterwards? I've never seen it done. I don't know is the answer. Yeah. I always felt like it would be helpful. Um, I, think, I think it's very important to at least get, um, so you're familiar with the patient's voice before they go, to, go through to surgery, but I'm not... I'm not sure how often they they actually go through how to use um, electric larynx beforehand. I, I don't perhaps okay. Ian can, yeah. would know that better. Yeah, because I've always felt bad when you sort of you know they're in that post-op period, they've got so much going on, and then you hand them this electrical box. <laughs> I think Emma, you, uh, I'm sure you'll say as well, but I know maybe Alex obviously from London, but I have seen and Ian, I have seen hospitals and clinics if you're going to have a laryngectomy they try and get a laryngectomy that's gone through it a bit like mm. philip and say yeah. do you want to talk to someone that's gone through it because certainly from my point of view when i do talk to patients they say that is so helpful when they've actually had a someone who's got a laryngectomy actually walk into a little room and they have that private conversation and they suddenly realize that actually that scary bit now I can get on with life. Uh, uh, Emma, what's your thoughts of that? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly all our laryngectomy patients are really encouraged to um, um, sit down. And actually, when we um, when that consultation is going to happen, um, one of our laryngectomy um, representatives, support team uh, members, is always there booked at the same time of the, of the appointment so that they're available to chat to if that's the right time for them. But yeah, it's, it's absolutely crucial. And um, just to add there, uh, to kind of jump in and add, I mean, the kind of crucial sort of element there uh, is self-efficacy. It's, it's the kind of concept is the one's ability to, to kind of uh, feel confident in one's ability to cope. And one of the best ways of developing that for something you've never seen or had to cope before is seeing somebody else do it. So a kind of an effective model uh, of kind of coping, surviving, kind of having kind of dealt with it. And it's not purely about information. So if you were to, let's say, you know, have the person and then have the kind of list of information, uh, the person's sort of lived example would be much more effective at kind of bringing up the sense of self-efficacy, confidence, um, and inevitably then morale and kind of hopefulness uh, that goes with it. So a kind of a, you know, it's a very good way of, um, of modeling good coping if you can arrange that. And I think they, they do do so here at Imperial with a kind of pre, uh, uh, kind of pre assessments for clinics, speech and language therapy, CNS, um, and dietitian, and uh, uh, they will kind of engage patient uh, advocates uh, as well. Ian, your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's, well, a few things to say about that. I think one of the impacts of this pandemic is that we, we we routinely do that if we can we routinely do that we've completely stopped that now um, and that has probably going to last a year or two I suspect before we're back doing that routinely but it's a very useful thing for patients to meet I had never thought about the aspects that Alan talked about but I just thought generically it was it was a useful thing but that's uh, that's eye-opening to think that that's perhaps why they they can visualize that it's possible um, I mean, Chris mentioned, well, would you tell people about the side effects if they wouldn't, you know, if, they, if it would put them off treatment? And this speaks back to a bit of what was said before about using your intuition in consent. I mean, we, we don't, if we have a train wreck of a laryngectomy, they don't become our exemplar for someone we wheel out for them to meet, uh, you know, even if we expect a bad outcome. So in some ways, there can be a little bit of dishonesty in that, but we, they will tend to be the better performing laryngectomies. But 
even so, I think it's a very important thing for these people to see that there can be a high quality of life after, you know, I think a lot of people think if I lose my larynx, my quality of life is gone and I'll never get it back. And to be able to see that there, there you know, most people go back to functioning probably slightly less well than they did before, let's be honest, but there are still some a spectrum of function uh, and uh, it can be still very high quality of life after what seems before you undergo it a completely life changing and potentially life ending uh, procedure so yeah we do routinely do it in edinburgh or at least we did before covid and we're trying to think of a decent way to do it with the re- pandemic restrictions at present which is which is difficult if anyone has any ideas please share them ian i've got a great idea we just do it virtual like we are at the moment every month you yeah. have 120 people on we're doing virtual one-to-one meetings with patients from hospitals. So other hospitals are actually saying, I'll contact Chris and we'll set up a meeting. I'll contact, there's ways that we can do it the same as you would talking to a patient. I think it's just getting a protocol available and maybe we can take this out of the meeting and talk about it. And and again, with people like Emma and Alex, understand how we can do it. and obviously involve Ben as well, because I know Ben's a great believer in this. So maybe mm. we can take this out of it. And I'm sure between the people here, we can get a system sorted that will work. Sure. I think that'd be useful for people who are pending surgery, you know. Yeah. It's a big, it's a big change in, our, in the way we prehabilitate, which is a bit of a cheesy word. But, you know, yeah. we prehabilitate these patients and that's a major factor in that. Great point. Well, we've gone for over an hour. Most people who know me know I could probably carry a conversation on with a lamppost, but uh, you know we are time getting close to time for closing. There was one comment Laura Keach asked: um, Is there a way to get a what to expect guidebook or a link to a support page uh, that would be helpful? Um, I don't know of one off the top of my head. Maybe Chris can do some homework on that. Or yeah, we have. We have on our website uh, que- uh, questions to ask your health professionals. By the mere fact that you're asking that question, it normally raises what, why I'm asking that question and they normally will come back to us. So again, it's how much information you put on. But I, I, hate, I hate Dr. Google. I think Dr. Google is the worst thing that we've got. Um, and I'm always worried about putting too much information on our website because then people get scared. I would rather people ring us and talk and we talk through their concerns. So today's call on a 24 seven was I'm going in for radiotherapy. What do I really, what does the mask mean to me? They told me about this mask, you know, they've told me about it, but I don't really understand it. So then I explain to them with the dolls and everything else we've got, Oh, right. That's what it means. That's fine. Whereas how do you do all that on a book or on a website? It's just words. And it's like sending a text to somebody. You've no personality or character around that. And that text sometimes can upset someone when you didn't mean to upset them. And I think that's what happens with websites and books. Sometimes it is just text. So again, I'm a great believer in ringing up either the Mouth Cancer Foundation, the Oral Cancer Foundation, one of the charities that specialize in our field. Macmillan do a great job, and I love Macmillan to death, but they are very generic. And they are only open eight till five. Whereas most of us that are specialized in this area have out of hours, and we understand what they're going through. So why not just ring one of the many charities that are out there like the Swallows? I don't care which one you ring, as long as you ring one of them, you would get an honest and a professional feedback to your question. And the worst scenario is we'll say, okay, if you can't ask your health professional, tell me who it is and we'll go and ask them for you and raise that initial conversation. I think that's the best way of doing it personally. And that's what we've been doing for eight years supporting over 7,000 patients. So, you know, I'm not saying we've got it right and we're always learning, but I think, you know, there's a lot of good charities out there and are doing a lot of good work. And it's not just the Swallows. Pick one and talk to them. Great, thanks. So I'm gonna ask Ian, our host, to 
package this up and then I'll have Chris say a final word to put a bow on it. So go ahead, Ian. Okay, well, thanks for that, Arthur. And thanks to uh, go to a number of people. I know we've already kind of had a bit of a closing remarks, but we wanted to say thanks to all the speakers who've really put a lot of time and effort and made this a very valuable two-day conference. Uh, there are people who've submitted work behind the scenes, which has been discussed a little bit today, but that was also thanks go to them. Of course, it couldn't be done without sponsors, and so thanks to all the sponsors who've been involved. You know, they made it uh, they made it reality this year. Uh, and of course, thanks goes to all the Swallow families and patients, caregivers, health professionals, and companies who help out the conference. Tom Cattrall and the cap his captaining the mission control, without whose skills we couldn't have done this. And that's being done in the uh, in the background. John Wright from Red Dot Media created all the silly films and put an array of speakers, uh, the speakers' films together. Although personally, I'm a little bit suspicious about that opening credit sequence. Anyway, I'll speak to Chris about that after. Of course, we always thank Sharon for working behind the scenes, all her planning and organizational skills. Arthur. It goes without saying for chairing the sessions and particularly for getting up at three in the morning yeah. each day and then staying with us. Presumably, you could just go home and, or stay home and collapse immediately after, but uh, yeah, good. that's good of you to, to stay up for us. Uh, to Dominic Kay for chairing the research session, and of course, from for the attendees from all around the world. And I hear we've had people not just from the UK and US, but from India, Poland, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, the Middle East. So, hopefully, this has been a valuable contribution to head and neck cancer patient and clinician engagement uh, on an international uh, forum. So thanks, Chris, and we'll leave it to you to end the conference. Thank you. Um, it's quite emotional, really, because it's been 12 months hard work, and obviously we were all set to go to Edinburgh and have have scotch and, you know, teas and coffees and all enjoy this you know, and I know that Ian had his credit card all ready to, to entertain us all. But then COVID got in the way. Now, whether Ian sort of brought COVID in so he didn't have to use his money, who knows? But I don't think Scottish are that tight. Are they, Ian? Who knows? Um, but I think it's been an emotional ride this 12 months. At one stage, we thought we were going to have to call it off. And then I came up with this stupid idea. Well, why don't we just do it live on, on the Internet? And then I started realizing it's not that easy. The idea was easy. And I have to admit, up till five days ago, we still hadn't got a clue how we were going to do it. And then the wonderful Captain Tom came in, who happens to be my um, future son-in-law. So obviously I could get him working different hours and 24 seven to make it happen. But without Tom, then this wouldn't happen because he's put all this technology together. He's made sure behind the scenes it all works nice. And even yesterday's slip up in the morning, he tells me he'd done it purposely because laughter's the best medicine. So he had done it to scare me. Now, whether that's true or not, who knows? But he's done a great job and I have to thank him. The other person I have to thank is obviously John from Red Dot Media. You know, he put hours and hours and hours of all the speakers speak the talks that came through having to knit them all together then doing all the funny bits and he's done hours of work on this this conference um so they're two very special people that have helped us put it on there's all the friends there's all the friends of the swallows that you've mentioned everybody else has been brilliant arthur phenomenal again such a great patron of ours um, and, you know, Ian, such a shame we're not in Scotland, but obviously, you know, we will get back to Scotland and do it live one day. But to be president over two days is fantastic. And thank you for taking on the rain. So, you know, every every success to, to you and the team in Scotland. And I know we'll work very close together. Um, but the last one is my Sharon, who sits behind the scenes over the last 12 months, she does all the organizing, she does all the emails, she does all the chasing. She knocks me into shape when I come up with a stupid idea and she tells me I can't do it, so I still do it anyway. But she's um, the brains and the organization skill behind it. 
So if you think about it, you know, that's four or five people put on an international conference around the world. There are companies out there that spend hundreds of thousands of pounds to put something like this on and don't achieve what we've achieved. So I'm very proud of our team, what they've done. Um, so, yeah, it's emotional that it's the end. But now we start planning as of tomorrow, because Sharon's already done a spreadsheet already for Cardiff. And, you know, every year it gets better and better. And, you know, yesterday, it, if in, we started at 10 and at midnight, a thousand people had played back the sessions. That's a thousand people. That's unbelievable. That's without today. So by the time we get the stats today, who knows what the audience has been. On Twitter, has gone mad. We were trending on Twitter. And our, you know, COVID charts go like that at the moment. Ours went from that to that on Twitter. It's just unbelievable. So every credit to everybody. Thank you, everybody that's dialed in and listened. I'm very proud of everything that we do. Um, please stay safe in COVID. Listen to the experts, whether you like it or not. You know, COVID is here. And the last thing we want to do is lose anybody for next year in Cardiff. Otherwise, if we are live, you're not going to be able to, to spend Tim's money when we're in Cardiff. So stay safe, stay healthy, stay smiling. Laughter is the best medicine. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you all through 2021. And I look forward to welcoming you all to, to Cardiff in 2021. And really, I hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget, there will be a survey coming out. Um, please fill it in and let me know what your thoughts are. Bad thoughts keep to yourself. Good thoughts tell me and any other thoughts tell Sharon. But, you know, feedback is important to us. If we've missed something or you think we need to cover it next year, please tell us. Otherwise, I have to drum up the agenda on my own. And, you know, sometimes I need some inspiration from you guys. So please, anyone out there that want to feedback, then that'd be great. Speakers. Please recommend speakers all day long. You know, speakers are now wanting to come internationally, which is fantastic. So please recommend people. Um, what else have I got on here before I finish? Uh, yeah, just thank you, everybody. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all next year. Thanks a lot. And the conference is now closed. Thanks, guys.